Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Candidate Forum. My name is Dr. Lin Nguyen, and I am the president of the League of Women Voters of DeKalb County. And I would like to thank you, uh, everyone, for being here today. Um, I also would like to thank all the candidates for providing the DeKalb County voters an opportunity to hear directly from you. So we're very grateful for that. And I want to thank the DeKalb Public Library for this meaningful partnership. Um, and I would like to thank our members and volunteer. Um, there were countless intelligent and, and hard work that were put and to make um, to ensure that this candidate forum happens. So um, without any further delay, I'm going to hand everything over to Jan Donor, uh, our moderator for tonight. Thank you, Lynn. Welcome to the candidate forum presented by the League of Women Voters of DeKalb County. My name is Jan Dorner and I am from the League of Women Voters of Elmhurst and also serve on the state board. I live in DuPage County and in the Illinois State Representative District 47. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan organization that neither supports nor opposes candidates or parties for any office. The League's purpose is to promote political responsibility through the informed and active participation of citizens in government. Providing this forum allows citizens to become better informed about the issues facing this community and to become better acquainted with the candidates running for office. We are happy to provide this service for the community. Questions have been collected from league and community members before this forum and were screened for duplication, clarity and appropriateness for the office being discussed. Some questions have been provided to the candidates to help them prepare while other questions will be new to them. The beginning of this forum is between the two candidates seeking to represent the Illinois 70th House District of the Illinois General Assembly and the two candidates seeking to represent the 90th House District of the Illinois General Assembly. After a brief, brief break, we will present many of the candidates running to represent the different districts of the DeKalb County Board. All candidates have agreed to abide by the rules set forth prior to this forum. Each candidate will present a one minute introductory statement, then questions will be asked and each candidate will have up to one minute to respond in alternating order. Closing statements will be one minute as well. There will be timer signs on the screen and I will ask you to adhere to the time limits. When you see the stop sign, you may finish your sentence, but we ask you to conclude. So we will start with the two, the 70th and the 90th um, House representative uh, candidates. So the 70th is the two candidates are Jeff Kiker and Paul Stock Stoddard, and the 90th uh, candidates are Tom Demmer and Seth Will. Wiggins. So let's start with Jeff Kiker's opening statement. One minute. Thank you, Jan, and thank you to the League for hosting this tonight. I greatly appreciate the opportunity to speak to everyone. Um, my name is Jeff Kiker. I'm the current representative in the 70th District, representing a large part of DeKalb County, parts of Kane County, and Boone County. I was raised by a single mother who worked very hard, waiting tables to keep a roof over our head. Myself and my two sisters put our own way through NIU, and I'm a proud alum of that institution, as are my two sisters. I was fortunate enough to meet a woman of amazing quality who's my wife of 23 years. We have three amazing children uh, who both give us joy and challenges as we go through. I've only been state representative for two years, but in that time, I've passed a number of significant bipartisan pieces of legislation that have led directly to the helping of Facebook to locate in DeKalb County, for our candy to locate in DeKalb County, and Syngenta Seeds to locate in DeKalb County. I also worked with the governor and my Democrat peers to expand mammogram protections for women seeking diagnostic mammograms as well as protections for sexual assault victims. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, the next opening statement is Paul Stoddard, also a candidate for the 70th district. Thank you, and thank you to the League for sponsoring this. This is a great service. Um, I'm a retired NIU professor. I taught geology there for 29 years. Before that, I uh, got my degrees from Brown University, Texas A&M, 
finally my PhD from Northwestern. Um, I spent a couple of years in the oil patch working in Denver and then down in Lafayette, Louisiana uh, for Conoco. Um, one of the things I learned uh, being trained as and then acting as a professional geologist is an appreciation for data and drawing conclusions based on data. But even more important than that is the knowledge that I don't have all the answers. No one has all the answers. In science, we always are looking for input from our people who disagree with us to try to refine and improve our answers. And I want to bring that type of attitude down to Springfield, like I brought it to the DeKalb County Board, where I'm currently a member. So with that, I turn it over back to Jan. Thank you. The next opening statement is from Tom Demmer, who is a candidate for the 70th district. He's not unmuted yet. There we go. Well, good evening, everybody. And thank you uh, to the League of Women Voters for hosting this forum uh, again tonight. My name is Tom Demmer. I'm the representative for the 90th district in the House of Representatives. That includes parts of Lee, Ogle, DeKalb, and LaSalle counties. Uh, myself, I was born and raised in Dixon, and I still live here in Dixon with my wife, our four-year-old daughter, and we have another on the way. Uh, so Dixon's been my home throughout my life. In the House of Representatives, I've tried to lead by example in reaching across the aisle to tackle some of the biggest problems and biggest challenges our state has. I'm the chief budget negotiator for the House Republican Caucus, and I also lead our caucus's efforts in healthcare policy. Both are areas where in order to make real meaningful progress, we have to have collaboration between both Republicans and Democrats. I've done more than just talk about bipartisanship. I've shown it in my eight years in the House of Representatives. And if elected for another term, I'll continue to work with any party to make progress for the state of Illinois. Thank you. Thank you. Um, our next opening statement is from Seth Wiggins. He is also running for the 70th, I'm sorry, the 90th district. Thank you, Jan. Uh, good evening and thank you to the league for, for hosting this event. Also, thank you to Representative Demmer for being here so that we can inform voters as to the choices on the ballot before them. Um, my name is Seth Wiggins. I'm the Democratic nominee asking for your vote to represent District 90 down in Springfield. And I'm running on a campaign of three main pillars. So accessibility, equality, and service. Now to that end, the life experience, the education, the military service that I bring to back those goals is this. I'm a 12-year veteran of the United States Air Force. I started on active duty in military intelligence, and I continue my service now as a non-commissioned officer in the Air National Guard. Um, from that, I have leadership skills that I'd like to bring down to Springfield that places my individuality to the side, doesn't take part in partisan politics, and instead embraces the common goal and builds upon that. So we have bipartisan compromise and reform. Um, additionally, I'm an attorney, so I'm very familiar with the laws and the way that they impact people right here in the district and the way that we need to address laws and change laws down in Springfield if I'm given the opportunity. And most importantly, I'm a parent and a foster parent. So from that, I have thank great, uh, I'm sorry, time? Yes, thank okay, you. I appreciate that. I can't see Emily, I'm sorry, guys. Right. Um, so I'm going to make sure that every, all of you get to be first um, a couple of times here. So we're gonna start with Seth Wiggins for question one. Okay. Seth Wiggins is, is candidate for the 90th district. Would you support or oppose legislation to have reapportionment handled by an appointed commission rather than the legislature? Why or why not? Okay, so reapportionment uh, for those viewing is something that happens after every census. So it's happened since 1971 when the most recent uh, version of the constitution was ratified. So every 10 years we get a chance to look at population if it's left the district, if it's come into the district, and if that changes how many people represent the district and how we redistrict or draw the boundaries geographically of our district. Um, what's happened every single time that the legislature's had the opportunity under Article 4 of the Constitution in our state uh, to put forth a plan that's adopted is there's always a gridlock. So Democrats put up a plan, Republicans say no. Republicans put up a plan, Democrats say no. And then what happens is there's an independent commission consisting of four Republicans, four Democrats, same gridlock because it's the same parties with the same interests. So then we have to go to the Secretary of State and say, hey, let's pick from these two names and have a ninth member. And whichever party that person falls in is typically what plans adopted. So 
for me as a taxpayer, what happens is we kick the can to an inevitable independent commission that if we could appoint in the first place by way of an amendment to Article 4 in the Constitution, uh, we could avoid that wasted taxpayer dollars of that entire process. Okay, in a, in a that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Demmer, also uh, running for the 90th district, same question. Yeah, thanks for the, uh, the question. Um, I'm a big supporter of fair maps. I think maps should be drawn not by uh, political parties or uh, elected officials. Maps should be drawn by people who have the best interest of voters in mind. So uh, voters get to pick their elected officials and politicians don't get to pick their voters. Um, in fact, in the last couple of years, I've been a sponsor of legislation in the House to in institute a fair mapping process like we have in so many other states. A few years ago, I worked with uh, the League of Women Voters, the Farm Bureau, and all kinds of other community organizations on a petition drive, gathering signatures from a million Illinoisans who said, we have to have fair maps if we want to have a legislature that accurately represents the views of the people of Illinois. Um, unfortunately, that uh, after we collected those petitions, uh, Mike Madigan and his attorneys challenged that in court, got that question taken off the ballot, uh, and voters didn't get a chance to weigh in. So I'm firmly a supporter of fair maps. I've stood with the League of Women Voters and other organizations to try to make sure that Illinois voters' voices are heard in the redistricting process. Thank you. Same question for candidate Stoddard running for the 70th district. I, I'm also a big proponent of fair maps. It's one of the six proposals I have to try to uh, improve the level of politics down in Springfield. Uh, last time around, um, that would have been 2010, 2011, I actually submitted two computer drawn maps uh, to the county board uh, for redistricting. Unfortunately, uh, they both lost on essentially party line votes um, <clears throat> by the other party. Uh, but I, I fully favor this. I, I think um, there are various models out there. I'm, I'm in favor of anyone that works. My personal favorite would be one where a, a bipartisan commission gets together and sets the parameters. What do we want to see in these maps? Uh, they should not be drawn for political gain, clearly. Uh, but there might be other things that we want to see in there. They should agree on those. Let the computer draw the map, draw us two or three different maps using different algorithms, and then let that commission recommend one going forward. Thank you. Thank you. And candidate Kiker from, from the 70th district, the same question. Thank you. Um, I stand with the League of Women Voters in supporting a Fair Maps Amendment. Um, I think most politicians in the state of Illinois do support a Fair Maps Amendment. And what we've seen is not just once, but twice over the course of the last 15 years. We've seen Speaker Madigan and his attorney knock both attempts by voters of the Fair Maps Amendment off of the ballot. And there was even a strong push this past election cycle over the past General Assembly to do it once again. The example that I continue to look at, Jan, is the state of Iowa. If you haven't had the opportunity, I would encourage you to look at the Iowa State Legislative Districts. And what you will find is it is an amazing quilt-like picture where they first seek to keep cities, townships, and counties together within a single legislative district so that that district has a voice and it's not split. I co-sponsor currently two bills that are in uh, rules committee, unfortunately right now, but I absolutely unequivocally support fair maps. And I think that would go a long way towards resolving Illinois issues with the political sphere. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next question, we're going to start with Paul Stoddard who is running in the 70th district. And that question is, name something specific that you are willing to cut from the state's budget. So this is always the, the, the battle. Um, obviously, Illinois has some severe financial issues to deal with. Uh, you know, and the budget troubles of several years ago where we had a stalemate and things were funded more by uh, judicial fiat than by legislative intent, uh, really hindered and harmed many of our agencies, institutions, and services. Um, Northern Illinois University, for example, now is getting less in income uh, from the state than it did in 2015 in, in real dollars. Um, things to cut, 
many of these agencies have been cut, uh, but I would look at administrative bloat and, and the universities and in other uh, agencies. Uh, I'd like to see a, a percentage, a certain amount of percent of, of state revenue or state support for these places dedicated to administration, but anything other than that has to go to their essential service such as academics. Thank you. Um, Jeff Kiker, uh, name something specific you're willing to cut from the state budget. The SIU Daily Egyptian newspaper. <laughs> so let me give some perspective to that. I sit on higher education appropriations and we had the opportunity during 2019 to sit down and have substantial budget talks. We spent on that committee a bipartisan 22 hours cutting and trimming the Illinois state higher education budget so that we could get our higher ed institutions like Northern Illinois University on efficient footing that gave them more flexibility in today's reality to respond to what they were seeing. So we trimmed and cut and one of the things that we cut was the Daily Egyptian Southern Illinois newspaper. And it was fantastic, right? There were a number of other things such as uh, some, some business parks and ethanol parks that we wound up going through and trimming. However, in April of 2019, when the state realized a gain of $1.4 billion more than anticipated, we sat back down in that room and within 15 minutes, my Democrat counterparts on that committee wiped out all the cuts that we made. So we are still today paying for the Daily Egyptian newspaper at SIU, the only student newspaper that is supported by the taxpayers of the state of Illinois, Thank because you. it was a favor given long ago. Thank you. Uh, Seth Wiggins from running uh, from District 90. Uh, what are you willing to cut from the state budget? Thank you, Jim. Uh, what I think would be favorable to cut, and I think it would be intersectional in meeting goals that we have, both for environmental policy as well as for fiscal uh, discipline and budgetary policy, is cutting that portion of carbon subsidies that has to do with fossil fuel. So in our district right now, in Byron, we have a nuclear plant that's set to shut down and decommission early before it's set to retire uh, as previously planned. And one of the reasons that the president of IBW has uh, set forth as leading to that decision is the non-economical value of nuclear power when compared to fossil fuels. So when we're looking at making climate policy better, when we're looking at better purity in our environmental policy as a state in ways that we can transition more quickly to cleaner energy policy, one of the things we have to cut out is coal and fossil fuels generally. So if we cannot subsidize those and take less state dollars and reappropriate them to underserved areas, that I think that would be favorable in my opinion. Thank you. Tom Demmer uh, from District 90, same question. Yeah, thanks for the, the question. Uh, you know, I've spent a lot of time with the state budget, and I think there are a number of programs across the board that uh, need uh, strict scrutiny. Um, you know, the governor's office has asked for a 6.5% reduction across all agencies and, and operating lines. I think that's a great place to start. But to give it a specific example, you know, sometimes we have a program that sounds like a good idea, but it doesn't deliver the kind of results that we need it to. There's been a program in Illinois called Grow Your Own Teachers, uh, and it's a program that's designed to try to get students to uh, pursue a career in education in Illinois. The unfortunate part is we've spent millions and millions of dollars and had very, very little to show for it. Uh, a lot of times the tough budget decisions come down to not whether the concept is a good idea, but whether the execution is a good idea. And so we need to look at programs that have maybe a good concept behind them, but are not delivering the kind of value and bang for the buck that we expect and take those dollars and put them someplace else. Thank you, Mr. Demmer. We're gonna go with you to start question number three. Um, name one potential source of new income for the state. Well, let's talk about a lot of new sources of potential income. Every job that we bring to the state of Illinois is a new source of income for the for the state of Illinois. Uh, through income tax, through property taxes of somebody who moves into the state of Illinois to, to work, to bring a family. Um, job creation is the best way we have to create new revenue for the state. And to that end, I've been working across the aisle to put in place programs like the Data Center Incentive Act that's bringing in $800 million dollar um, Facebook data center to DeKalb County, um, program like the, uh, the manufacturer's uh, purchase credit that helps manufacturers bring new investments into Illinois or buy additional equipment to help them uh, expand to further lines. Every job that comes in is a source of new revenue for Illinois, but more importantly, every job that comes in is a new opportunity for somebody to live, 
work and raise a family here in this great state. Thank you. Mr. Wiggins from the 90th district, same question, one potential source of new income for the state. Sure, Jan, I'm actually gonna agree with uh, my opponent, the incumbent representative Demmer on this. I think that jobs and job creation is one of the easiest ways to have more disposable income and to have that income invested into our economy as well as to retain people in the state uh, uh, for financial opportunities. Now, I've put out three different jobs-based initiatives. They focus on one, um, offering people in that pipeline between high school and trade, tech, or, or college a way to afford that uh, through tuition subsidies for civil service in our underfunded state agencies. Another connects people reintegrating society after periods of incarceration or imprisonment with skills and connecting them to jobs to have them be uh, contributing to society. And then also um, a way to bridge income for those people who run up to the expiration or maximum of unemployment benefits. So those jobs-based initiatives would help grow the district and add to the economy. Also, we need to have jobs with livable wages. Mr. Demmer has a 22% grade by the AFL-CIO. It's because he constantly works against working families in our state. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Kiker from District 70, name one potential source of new income for the state. So the struggle is to, to point to just one thing because I think it's a compounded thing. And, and we see, especially with the, uh, with the work that we did in 2019, again, not to echo Tom, but that data center incentive is going to be transformational for the DeKalb County area. It is, it is potentially as transformational as the first railroad that came through our town. We are now with that and the candy company that is relocating its manufacturing and its distribution here due to the manufacturer's purchase credit. We're gonna have downward pressure on our property taxes in the city of DeKalb and the county of DeKalb for the first time in, in a very long time. That's not only gonna be great paying jobs that are gonna now be located in our backyard, but it's gonna bring more friends and neighbors, people that are gonna be able to shop at our downtown shops, eat at our local restaurants. Their kids are gonna be coming into our excellent schools and that continues to foster and grow. And what we've done by doing that is we've changed Illinois from a place that people leave to a place that Illinois has opportunity and an amazingly bright future that people can now see, wrap their arms around and see the same vision that we do. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Stoddard, same question. Well, obviously job creation uh, is the easiest and best way to do it. Um, I don't know, as nice as it would be to think that we could solve all our problems by enticing more companies to come here, uh, I don't know that that's going to be enough to solve our problems. Um, <clears throat> we need to seriously think about the whole tax structure for the state of Illinois. We rely too much on property taxes. Everybody in this forum is going to agree on that. Uh, we use them to, to fund um, education. No other state does it to the same degree that we do, not even close. We need to really take a, a solid look at the whole way we tax, we raise revenue which is taxes, let's be honest. Uh, one of the things I think we might consider a new source would be what they call a South Street tax, a very small percentage on financial transactions. We have a great many financial transactions in the state, uh, thing, you know, buying and selling stocks. Um, thank you. Be a minor, anyway, thank you. Thank you. Um, next question, Jeff Kiker from District 7 is first uh, to answer. Climate change is underway. What can the state do to be proactive rather than reactive to it? Well, I think today I had the perfect opportunity to highlight that. Uh, Representative Demmer and I had the distinct opportunity to go out and tour the Byron Nuclear Facility that just announced that they would potentially be closing if we didn't support. They provide an amazing amount of carbon neutral power to our area, to our state, that is unrivaled. The capacity and the issues that they're running into are because they're so good and produce it at such a low cost that their power onto the market isn't giving a return for the amount of structural improvements that need to happen out there. We need to grow and we need to support what nuclear energy does because folks, when we think about green new energy and we think about solar panels and wind farms, those are amazing and, and wonderful opportunities on the horizon. But if we run into a polar vortex or a super hot summer like we have so frequently over the past with this climate change, we need that base load. We need that power. And the only way to get there in a carbon neutral way to save our environment is through utilizing nuclear in a better, fuller capacity. Thank you. Thank you. District 70, Mr. Stoddard, same question. 
Very important question. Climate change is one of the greatest threats uh, we as a nation, we as a, a race, the human race face uh, these days. Um, I think we need to, to really look again, big picture, make sure we have a very diverse energy uh, structure. We need to consider wind and solar farms as, as a key component of that. In my time on the county board, we've approved uh, the solar uh, wind farm down in the southern part of the DeKalb County. And we are now in the process of approving a bunch of solar gardens. They're not quite as big as, as a solar farm would be. Um, the state has, has done uh, nice work in encouraging development of these projects. I'd like to see us actually try to entice manufacturers of solar panels and, and turbine blades uh, to come to, the, to Illinois and, and really turn us into a green state. Thank you. Mr. Demmer, same question, District 90. You know, one of our, the best things about our, our area is that we have for a long time been a source of major energy generation. Uh, the nuclear plant that uh, Jeff talked about, you know, we've been through that several times. It has hundreds of high paying jobs, uh, generates enough electricity for 2 million homes uh, and generates it with remarkable reliability. It's a huge cornerstone of the, the local economy and an incredibly important asset for us to protect. But add on to that some of the development we've seen in recent years with wind and solar. You know, before I was in the House of Representatives, I was on the Lee County Board, and we had to work through the permitting and siting process for several wind farms that came to our area before they really came to anywhere else in the state of Illinois. Today, we have similar opportunities that are presenting themselves with solar installations. I think we need to take the advantage of the geographic location we have the natural resources that are around and embrace a nuclear, wind, solar, carbon-free future to provide electricity and to help fight climate change. Thank you. Mr. Wiggins, can you finish up this question? District 90. Yes, Your Honor. Er, yes, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry. Um, so <laughs> I hold you in high regard. So if there you think, <laughs> One, climate policy is two part in my opinion. It's not just necessarily discussions about energy. However, I will give my comment on that. It's also discussions on environmental policy generally, okay? So when we're talking about energy, again, I, I believe all uh, candidates here have discussed the Byron nuclear plant and I stand firm in supporting any negotiations, anything that needs to come away so that that community doesn't lose $62 million annually. Cause that's not just the nuke plant. That's not just jobs. That's also their education policy that's gutted because it doesn't have funding anymore. So. That's a cornerstone of my policy in my, my campaign is, is supporting quality public education. So obviously I wanna do anything that also encourages that as a byproduct. Now we need to in, invest in research and development for wind and solar, but the output is not necessarily there. I've listened to constituents. We need to invest in the zero uh, emission carbon footprint that nuclear offers. But we also need to make sure that we hold accountable uh, air quality. And I, I've got the card there, so I'll, I'll end, end there. Thank Thanks. You. So we're gonna start with you again, Mr. Wiggins. Um, okay. D District 90, do you support or oppose a graduated income tax for Illinois? Why or why not? Sure, I do support a graduated income tax and uh, it, it's multifactorial why. Um, right now with a flat income tax, everyone's taxed as of 2017 when it hiked up at 4.95%. Um, the condition of our fiscal policy in the state, uh, while Mr. Demmer has, has echoed in almost every interview I've, I've seen and I agree with him to this point, uh, our lawmakers have not exercised fiscal restraint and fiscal responsibility. That being said, it doesn't change the circumstances in which we are, where we either have to cut or we have to increase revenue. Now, when we look at what programs would be cut, I've got a district that has 10.8% on food stamps and food assistance. I've got a district that has a larger portion than that 10.8% on welfare programs as a reliance to bring themselves up and plan for their wealth in the future. We have subsidized daycare, subsidized uh, uh, lunches, subsidized um, utilities, Cutting is not necessarily going to be popular with anyone nor favorable to the state. So raising revenue, if we go flatly across the board, that's on the middle class and the lower class as well. If it's graduated, we at least have the flexibility to do it on the people who have disposable income and leave the others who can't pay without a tax hike on them. Thank you. Mr. Demmer, same question. I oppose the graduated income tax increase. Look, um, the voters across Illinois are going to weigh in on this and, and, and the ballot in November. Um, and they're looking at it from a couple, of, a couple of things. First, over the last decade, Illinois has increased the income tax twice. 
The first time it was said to be temporary, it was going to be an, a little extra tax money and it'll take care of the problems that we have. The second time it was, we didn't do what we should have done and, and right size government uh, for the first tax increase and it had to come back in place. Now here we are only a few years later and again, legislative uh, legislators are asking for three and a half billion dollar tax increase. The reality is if we're ever going to turn the corner on the financial challenges the state has had, we must pay as much attention to the expense side as we do to the revenue side. Taxes should not be the first instinct of legislators to raise them every time we run into a problem. We've got to look across the board. The governor has called for this, but then never come out with any ideas. We need to engage directors and agency heads and ask where we can make reductions without affecting core services. There's room there. Thank you. Uh, District 70, Mr. Stoddard, how do you feel about uh, graduated income tax? I'm in favor of it. I'm in favor of it both because it will help us with our financial situation and also it's a matter of fairness. Um, when you look at the total tax burden on a taxpayer in Illinois, that's including income tax, property tax, sales tax, user fees, etc. It turns out that the lower classes are paying the highest percentage of their income in taxes. 12.4% or so is the estimate I've seen. The middle class is about 9.4% and the upper classes are about 7.4%. A graduated income tax allows us to equal that playing field a little bit. It gives us the flexibility to start talking about how to adjust our tax structure to be fairer for everybody, not just tax the rich, but how can we gain more revenue necessary to be able to cut people's property taxes, to take our dependence away, our educational dependence away from local property taxes, which are unfair educationally as well as, as to the property owners. So Thank we you. need that flexibility. I approve Thank of the fair tax amendment. Mr. Kiker, same question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I voted against it. And, and again, the voters are going to have an opportunity to decide next month what we do with that. And I echo what uh, Representative Demmer talked about over the course of the last two uh, decades uh, that we've had in the last 10 years, two opportunities to have this increased and we still haven't solved the problems. This plan isn't targeted. This plan will not solve the pension problem. This plan will not solve the property tax problem. This plan will not solve the funding of schools problem. Our governor has introduced a budget that is $7 billion in the hole. This plan raises $3.6 billion. We have a shortfall that we haven't accounted for where that money and revenue is going to come from. So at the core, for me, when I voted against it, it comes down to legislator trust. And I do not trust the current legislature to spend judiciously with other people's money. Look, if we're sending tax dollars in, there better be a good purpose. And if there isn't a good purpose, we owe it to the people not to take their money and find another way to spend it. We need to be focused on the heartache that the people are facing under the current burden. Thank you. Um, we'll start with 70th District, Mr. Stoddard. What ethical reforms does Illinois state government need? Can I take all my time for the rest of the questions on this one? <laughs> <laughs> so. Do you think you're running for vice president? <laughs> no, not yet. Uh, no, definitely not. We need, we have a system that, that allows people too much power. Um, and when we concentrate too much power in too few hands, you just are begging for, for corruption. That much power attracts corruption. Absolute power corrupts, absolutely. I've got a six point plan to try to spread that power out throughout the state, throughout both parties. I'd like to see fair map redistricting. I'd like to see power sharing between the parties in terms of committee ownership in Springfield. I'd like to see term limits on the leadership positions. I'd like to see less reliance on out of state or out of district funding of campaigns to wit have the state match small political donations and only allow contributions from within the district. And finally, I'd like to see a one hat rule where a person can either be speaker or head of his party or her Thank party, you. but not both. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Kiker, what ethical reforms does Illinois state government need? Jan, thank you. I think primarily in that the, the Illinois House has, and Senate has a legislator, legislative inspector general. 
And right now, that investigator can only investigate a certain amount of things, and it must be approved by the legislators that sit on the panel. The first thing I think that is most important that we need to do is to allow that legislative inspector general to go wherever the leads take them, to go and find where the misdeeds are going. I don't know if we're up to four or five legislators that have been removed in my short tenure from the Illinois General Assembly because of misdeeds that are out there. And allowing the legislative inspector general to have that freedom would go a long way. We also need to separate lobbying. We have lobbyists that are in the General Assembly that go and lobby in Cook County or the city of Chicago. We can't have that. We need to make sure that while we're down there, we are doing good, honest work on behalf of the people. And that goes through having us have somebody look over our shoulder at each and every opportunity. Thank you. Uh, 90th District, Mr. Wiggins, same question. Yes, so I think the, the three greatest areas for improvement are this. Um, first, term limits. So to that end, I think that the job of a legislator, a lawmaker should be to go down, handle your business, take care of the best interests of your district, and then come home to your normal civilian job. Um, we don't aggregate power that turns into corruption that way. And we also hold a greater accountability of ourselves when we know that we're coming home. Uh, to that end, I made an oath that I would only be seeking two terms. So if I'm elected this time, I would seek one term of re-election. That's it. Uh, conversely, my, my opponent, the incumbent's on his fourth term, asking for a fifth term. Um, the second thing I'd ask for is a 10-year ban. So the pipeline between lawmakers and lobbyists. Lobbyists to lawmaker within 10 years, no. Lawmaker to lobbyists within 10 years, no. Because it, it positions people to try to be favorable to certain industries while they're in Springfield in hopes for a, a nice uh, cushy job afterwards. And that just breeds impropriety. The third thing is to have transparency in donations. So any elected official or candidate should have on their accessible website, their donations. Thank you, Mr. Demmer. Uh, the 90th district, uh, what ethical reforms does Illinois state government need? Yeah, I'll give you two examples. We've got a litany of changes we need to make to improve Illinois' ethics laws. Uh, one is a bill that I sponsored to uh, introduce that would make it illegal for a sitting member of the General Assembly to serve as a lobbyist at the same time. Frankly, most folks are, are shocked that's even allowed today. It is. Uh, it got a couple folks into trouble. We had people who have been indicted and removed. The second item, I think, is holding people accountable regardless of the position that they're in. Uh, I'm right now the ranking Republican member on a special investigative committee looking into the misdeeds of House Speaker Mike Madigan, the most powerful person in the House of Representatives, probably the most powerful politician in the state. He was mentioned 72 times in a deferred prosecution agreement where ComEd admitted to a decade-long scheme to bribe Mike Madigan. We need to show that rules apply to everyone that we're going to hold people accountable regardless of their political positions. And we need to make sure that investigations can be conducted in a fair, above board and transparent way to show the people of Illinois we're serious about re-earning their trust. Thank you. Mr. Demmer, I, I want you to be the first on the next question. Um, what legislative, but I'm sorry, what legislative committees would you like to serve on and why? Well, the committees that I serve on right now are really the areas that I'll, I'd like to continue to focus on. And that's largely as relates to the state budget and uh, healthcare policy. So in the state budget, we have five appropriations committees. Um, I'm the, the Republican lead on the human service appropriation committee, uh, but then also conduct our broad budget negotiations uh, with House Democrats, Senate Democrats, and Senate Republicans and the governor's office all together. I'd like to continue to work on that. Uh, additionally, I, I work I'm on several committees related to Medicaid. That's a program that covers one in four individuals in the state of Illinois. We have a great bipartisan Medicaid work group from both chambers, both parties. We meet all through the year and try to come up with common sense ways that we can improve the state's healthcare system. In fact, it's so successful, so productive that even in a year where we don't have a lot of agreement, the Medicaid omnibus bill that made a lot of positive changes passed unanimously this year. And I think that's the kind of uh, example we should give as how you can work on complex and important state policies. Thank you. Uh, District 90, Mr. Wiggins, what committees would you like to serve on? Thanks, Jan. Um, as a veteran, I would like to, I, I would be honored to serve on the Veterans Affairs uh, Committee. Um, I believe that there's a lot of work 
and taking care of our veterans and taking care of those people who have left service or like me am a veteran of Afghanistan, veteran of active duty, military intelligence, but now I am serving in a guard capacity and kind of fall through the cracks as far as services that are supposed to be connected to folks like me, but that aren't advertised or aren't, uh, don't have that mission fulfilled because the VA is underfunded. Um, when we talk about budget, Mr. Demmer uh, mentioned some that he's on the Appropriations Committee and Budget Committee. I would like that as well because my leadership, my, my toolkit that I have, so to speak, as far as negotiations, both as an attorney and as a service member with integrity and, and very mission-centric, um, I'm used to putting myself to the side, looking at the shared common goal, and even with people with whom I, I disagree, we find common ground and we build upon that. I'd like to do that in budget negotiations because we need to have a balanced budget. Thank you. Um, District 70, Mr. Kiker, what legislative committees would you like to serve on and why? Thank you, Jan. Uh, if, I, if I could, and so they recreate the committees every two years during a general assembly. So provided they're the same, I would like my same portfolio of committees. I serve on the agriculture committee and agriculture and conservation. And so we look at a number of issues that relate to what folks in our district actually are most impacted by on a regular basis. And I was proud to earn the endorsement of the uh, Farm Bureau Act Activator Group. Um, I also serve on Veterans Affairs. I'm the proud grandson of two Korean War veterans and the proud stepbrother of an, a colonel in the Illinois National Guard, 122nd Field Artillery Battalion. Um, higher education and higher education appropriation are two different committees that, that I have a huge passion for in preserving what NIU has done for my family, for myself and my two sisters, and making sure that that institution can still be there for future generations to be a generational change maker for families like mine. State government, I loved because I was able to impact some of the policies that we have in the state of Illinois and make them more common sense. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Stoddard. Uh, with the 70th district. Right, thank you. Um, well, clearly higher ed, uh, as a career uh, professor at Northern, I understand the value of education, how important education is in advancing the state. Uh, we need a well-educated workforce. Education is the key for so many of our uh, children to, to succeed and, and go on and, and do great things. Um, so higher ed, higher ed appropriations, both of those. This, uh, this district is, is heavily ag, uh, so the Agriculture and Conservation Committee is a very important one, I think, to, for me to be on. Um, and then budget, and, and I've, I've been chair of the uh, county boards, Cal County Board's Budget uh, Finance Committee, and actually saw the first two or three balanced budgets we had had, truly balanced budgets we had had in years. And I helped guide us through the mess of the 2008 uh, recession. And finally, uh, pension reform, uh, pension situation is, is one of the real thorns in our financial side. I'd like to take a hand at helping to solve that. Thank you. Mr. Kiker, would you be the first one on this question? Would you support or oppose legislation to make judges appointed by a commission rather than elected? Why? Listen, I think, I think that's, a, that's a fair thing. I would want to see what the legislation looked like, of course, and, and what the function is. The challenge that I would want to make sure is in place is that with some of these judicial appointments, the folks appointing may be uh, too close to, to the appointment, if you will. So um, I think that's something that, that perhaps has, has met its time and we need to look at. And we see what's happening in some of the Supreme Court races that are happening in the state of Illinois right now. Um, and I, I think a, a lawyer, an attorney should stand on the merits of what they've accomplished and what they've done. And I think a, perhaps an alternative method would be something I'd be highly interested in looking at. Mr. Stoddard, same question. I have to agree uh, with Mr. Kiker on this. I, I think, um, you know, anytime we have people who are in charge of our government, our judicial system, whatever it is, if they're elected, they are more responsive to the community they serve. Uh, so I, I think, you know, looking at, at that potential change um, is something that we should consider. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the 90th District, Mr. Demmer. Yeah, thanks for the question. It's an interesting one. I think there's, um, you know, first there's quite a few levels of uh, courts in the state of Illinois. Some where you have a good knowledge of uh, some attorneys in your community, some judges in your community. 
You might be able to follow along with some of the cases that they presided over and make an informed decision as a voter. But the higher you get, maybe the more dis detached uh, the average voter would be from being in a position of really being able to evaluate uh, whether someone is qualified to serve in those um, upper levels of law. So I think there might be an opportunity for, uh, for a hybrid with um, some additional appointment uh, positions while retaining the ability for people in their communities for their county or for their circuit um, to be able to uh, vote for, to work for, to support politically uh, people in their community who they think are uh, have the right temperament and the right qualifications to sit on their local bench. And Mr. Wiggins. So as a member of this career field, I, I have a few uh, unique perspectives. Um, one of the things as an attorney that we rely upon and those people who are elected or appointed to the bench, so judges, is uh, impartiality. Um, that's from law school on, that's, that's ingrained into us. They shouldn't uh, show partisan leanings. They shouldn't show, you know, explicitly or publicly whether they're Republican, conservative, liberal, Democrat. And so I would support a ballot where we have elections, because uh, I, be I believe each of the candidates have had a good point about accountability with the voters um, and the communities that elect them. Um, but that it's a nonpartisan, so the R isn't there, the D isn't there, and you're not voting specifically on party lines, but instead you're invested in researching the candidates and looking at the merits of their career and their experience and the judici judiciousness that they bring to their um, service on the bench. Also, though, I do believe they're also in a hybrid system where we have appointments toward the upper echelon, so the appellate court and the Supreme Court, by people who know what is required of those posts. Um, however, I'll stop there. Thank you. So we've had eight questions. We've covered a variety of issues. Um, we, we need to move on to the county board. So I'd like to call for closing statements. And I'd like to start with District 90, Seth Wiggins. Thank you, Jan. Um, so again, I'm the Democratic nominee asking for your vote to go down to Springfield and represent our district. Now I have a diversity of life experience. I have a formal education in law, but who cares about that? I'm more concerned and I connect with voters more on the basis that I'm a parent, I'm a biddy ball coach, uh, I'm a foster parent, very familiar with the fact that we have a deficit in spending and advocacy for mental health services, substance abuse services, um, homeless services, services for our veterans, um, services for single mothers. And I'd like to point accessibility and equality focus on that. Um, additionally, I'm an out member of the LGBTQ community. I'm a transgender man. So for the first 29 years of my life, I was, I was born as a female. I lived as a female. And for four years now, I've transitioned and am now male. Um, I've lived in both genders and I've seen the pressures on women. I want to advocate for and advance equal rights for women in the state. And I also want my jobs-based initiatives to connect opportunity for those in our district to put themselves forward and grow the district. So on that basis, I'm asking for your vote to send me to Springfield and advocate for us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, District 90, candidate Tom Demmer, your closing statement, please. Yes, uh, thanks again for hosting this and, and thanks to Seth for being here for, to be part of this conversation. This is a great opportunity for everybody, even when we can't get together in person, to be able to still have an airing of our views. Look, I view my job as your state representative through two lenses. One is to look out for issues that affect the entire state of Illinois. I've talked about how I do that through budget negotiations, through being a leader in healthcare policy that affects the state. But we also, as state representatives, have to fight for our districts. And sometimes that means doing typical constituent work, the normal things that come up in the, in the duty of, uh, of the day. But sometimes it means dealing with curveballs, like when COVID hit. When COVID hit, you know, my office, we, we quickly turned ourselves and said, what can we do to host Facebook Live or Zoom town halls? How can we help people who have never been through unemployment before fill out unemployment claims? How can we get small businesses the financial support or the grants they need to be able to keep their doors open? You elect a state representative to be able to fight for you when it matters. That's exactly what I've tried to do as your state representative, and that's what exactly what I'll do for the next two years. Thank you. Uh, District 70, let's start with Paul Stoddard. Your one-minute closing statement, please. Thank you. And again, thank you for staging this. Thank you to Seth and Jeff and Tom for, for joining in on this. It's been a very interesting, and I think in some ways enlightening discussion. I heard good ideas from everybody who participated, so I appreciate that. I think it's a shame we didn't have a chance to uh, deal with some of the issues that have come up recently, specifically the Black Lives Matter movement, COVID that Mr. Demmer touched on. 
Um, healthcare is obviously a very important issue uh, for the people of the state. School funding, there's so many things that we could have been talking about. Uh, but there are many things, important things that we obviously did. Overall, again, I think we work best when we work together. That's been the theme of my campaign. I want to make a system in Springfield like I did on the DeKalb County Board that reduces partisanship and gets us as, as people representing our interests, the interests of our constituents, coming together, listening to each other, and reaching decisions by consensus as much as possible, rather than by one party shoving their views down the minority party's throats just because they can. Thank That's you. what I'd like to achieve. Thank you. Thank you. District 70, Jeff Kikers, one minute closing statement, please. Thank you so much. And thank you to the League of Women Voters and, and for hosting this. And, and I think I want to frame my answer in, in thinking about the, the women out there that you're representing and what they want out of their elected official. I've only been there for one term. And what most people want, and what most people hear from is they want health care protected. I've done that. I've expanded it, especially with the mammogram screenings. They want support and expanded funding for education. I've done that at both the elementary and secondary level, as well as the higher education level. They want someone who's bipartisan and can work across the aisle. Listen, there's 44 Republicans, 74 Democrats. Everything I do must be bipartisan. And there were many times where I went against the wishes of my party to do what was right for the 70th district. They want jobs done. We're bringing more jobs to this area than have come in a very, very long time. They want their roads and bridges fixed. They want someone who doesn't need to answer to Mike Madigan for every favor, every opportunity, and every bill that they want passed. And I won't. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this ends our portion of the state rep uh, candidates. We'll take a short break, but I think those of you who live in the 70th and the 90th district have great choices, great people to choose from. Um, if you need further information, you can go to IllinoisVoterGuide.org and get further information on, on all of these candidates. Jan, are we still on? Yes. I apologize. I forgot to do something. I'm sorry, guys. Tom, I'm not saying anything substantive or taking more time. My kids are watching. Thank you, guys. I love you. I needed to say that. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Great, Jan, if you want, I can show the video now. Yes, please do. I'm gonna share my screen here with everybody. And we will get that video. If I can move this out of my way. So Emily is telling me there's no sound. Is that, is that true? Nobody can hear this? Jan, no sound. Well, I don't know how to, I'm, I'm playing it on the computer. You can all see the image though, correct? Yes. Just can't hear the sound. Maybe um, if you unmute everyone. Let me. Stop sharing my screen here for a second. So I don't think unmuting everybody is the answer because I believe then that, that they should be able to hear me since I'm unmuted. Okay. Um, I'm not sure why. Um, it, it, it appears that it, it won't be taking sound that my computer is making and allowing you to play. So, you know, All right. what I, 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 go ahead. If, if everybody's ready, we can move on to um, county board. That sounds fine to me. I closed the window that I was called from, so I'm good. <laughs> All right, yeah, let's just move on. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. We had a nice, uh, Jan found a wonderful four minute video for us to watch as a kind of uh, decompressor, but um, I'm not sure why the sound won't, uh, it, it's working for me, but apparently it's not translating to the Zoom meeting. Sorry about that, everybody. 
Okay, so we're going to start with the county board and we're doing we're doing the candidates who whose um, opponents are uh, who all of the candidates have shown up. So we are doing district three, four and eight together. And then we're and then later on in the evening, we're doing district 10 and 11 together. And in between, we are um, having two minute statements from candidates whose opposition um, are not showing up and it is against our policy as uh, League of Women Voters to um, not have at least two candidates for um, a race. So um, tonight for District 3, our two candidates are Patrick Deutsch and Josh Orr. For District 4 are Lori Emmer and Amber Keto. Keatno, excuse me, that's probably not right either, Quitno. And from District 8 is Bill Cummings and Christopher Porterfield. So we can start with District 3, Patrick Deutsch, your one minute opening statement, please. First of all, I'd like to thank the League of Women Voters uh, for letting us uh, all join in this forum. Uh, to introduce myself, I, my name is Patrick Deutsch. I, I, I'm married, have two wonderful kids, uh, Allie, who's eight, and Benjamin, who is three. Uh, just want to, the, the opportunity to represent this district came up, and I'd like to represent the people in, in my area and uh, hopefully guide, guide DeKalb County through this rough patch that we definitely are gonna have with, with COVID. Thank you. Thank you. Josh Orr from District 3. Yes, first off, thank you to the League of Women Voters for hosting last week and tonight's candidate forums. My name is Josh Orr, and I'm the Democratic candidate for DeKalb County Board District 3. The third district includes parts of Cortland and parts of Sycamore. I'm a 20-year resident of DeKalb County, having lived in uh, Sycamore previously and now in Cortland for 15 years. I graduated from Kishwaukee College and University of Illinois Springfield with a bachelor's in computer science. I work in the software field and I am a, the communications chair for the DeKalb County Democratic Party. My wife, Megan, is a graduate of NIU and Aurora University. She's a mental health professional in our community. I have two children, Evan and Abby, 25 and 18. Both are graduates of DeKalb High School and my son, Evan, graduated from NIU. I'm running for this seat to add another voice of reason, honesty, and experience to the board. I worked for 15 years for the Kane County Circuit Clerk's Office, during which I developed a deep understanding of how county government works. Thank you. Thank you. District 4, Lori Emmer, your one minute opening statement, please. Thank you uh, to the Junior League of Women's Voters for this opportunity. It's a great year to be running for our office in the 100th year of women's suffrage. I am the Republican uh, candidate currently serving on the county board for Sycamore District 4. Um, I am married to Mike Emmer. I have four children. I have four kids and I have a, a bachelor's in business administration from St. Louis University, a bachelor's in history and a bachelor's in political science from Northern Illinois University. I served 24 years in the United States Army I have worked for AFLAC and Edward Jones. I am currently the Veteran Foreign Wars State Commander for Illinois. I am running, well, I am running because I want to continue serving the community, especially bring us, continue to bring us forward during these difficult times of COVID-19. I have the experience, experience to continue doing it. Thank you. And District 4, uh, Amber Quitno, please uh, correct me if I'm saying your name wrong. You said it, you said it right this time. It's Amber Quitno, yes. So as I just said, my name is Amber Quitno. I'm running on the Democratic ticket, uh, DeKalb County Board District 4 in Sycamore. I'm a lifelong resident of DeKalb County and take great pride in being Sycamore strong. This community helped to build me into a strong leader. 
who fights for what's right. I have a master's degree in regulatory affairs, and I'm a local business owner of a staffing and consulting firm for the life science industries, uh, which I founded from the ground up. I'm also the proud mother of five children who are my heart and soul, three daughters who are young adults now, and nine-year-old identical twin boys. Anyone who knows me knows that I am a very protective uh, mother, very protective of my friends, my family, and my community. I have a deep sense of loyalty to this community, and I want to give back. I'm detail-oriented, science, and data-driven, and I will never sit back when I need to stand up and fight for what's right. Thank you. District 8, Bill Cummings, your right. opening statement. Okay. Hi, I'm Bill Cummings. Um, I want to remind everybody I'm William on the ballot, but uh, I go by Bill. Uh, and thanks to the League of Women Voters for, uh, again, hosting this event. This is really a good opportunity for all of us, I think, to uh, not only get to know each other, but uh, to express our, our views on some things. Um, I've been a 36-year resident of DeKalb. I came to uh, DeKalb in 1984 uh, to teach at NIU. Uh, and I stayed at NIU for 30 years. Um, I've taught accounting. I've been an accounting professor. Uh, have three degrees in accounting, my PhD from University of Missouri, and I'm also a CPA uh, in Illinois. Not a practicing one, but uh, an academic one. And uh, uh, I've lived in District 8 for, for uh, 30 years as well. Um, I'm president of the DeKalb uh, Public Library Board, and I'm also on the Kishwaukee Symphony uh, Board, vice president of that. So I'll stop there and- Thank uh, you. District 8, Christopher Porterfield, your opening statement, please. Thank you. And thank you to the league for doing this. My name is Chris Porterfield. I live in DeKalb, and I'm running for re-election uh, to be your District 8 representative on the county board. I currently chair the Health and Human Services Committee, and I'm on the Forest Preserve Committee and the operating board for the DeKalb County Nursing and Rehabilitation Center. Um, I came to DeKalb as a transfer student in 71, and with the exception of a few years, I've been here ever since. I retired from NIU a few years ago. My wife, Susan Azar Porterfield, is a poet and a retired English professor from Rockford University. I've been involved uh, with Stagecoach Community Theater since 1980. My other primary interests are family and friends, travel, and canoeing in the Boundary Waters. Um, I highly value the experience I've had the last few years in county government. I look forward to continuing my work with my colleagues on the board. I really appreciate your vote between now and uh, December 3rd. Thank you, take care, please vote. Thank you. We're going to start um, with the first question on, with uh, Josh Orr from District 3. What do you see as the major challenges currently facing the county board and how would you work to resolve them? All right. So the biggest challenge that's going to face us over the next couple of years is dealing with the uh, financial and other fallout from the COVID-19 pandemic. So the first thing I'm going to be doing there is looking for any opportunity to help out the uh, county health department. You know, we've got to replace stock stockpiles of PPE or make sure that whatever we're getting from state and federal gets into the hands of the practitioners. Um, we're also going to have a big budget crisis. So reasoning about that and trying to figure out ways to look for efficiencies within the existing budget is going to be a high priority. And I'll leave Thank it there. You. Thank you. Thank you. District 4, Lori Emmer. Uh, what do you see the major challenges currently facing the county board? Certainly uh, the pandemic right now uh, and the uncertainty. Um, how long is this going to go on? Uh, it's affecting our daily lives with our constituents. So many are unemployed. Uh, it's affecting, it has a big economic impact with our businesses. It's going to affect our budget. We don't know how, for how long, and the revenue's coming in. So we're going to have to take a very conservative look at our budget, um, bringing in revenues into our county. We need to look at economic growth with new companies coming in, 
how are we going to bring in jobs to get people working? Uh, we're, we were fortunate with Ferrara, Facebook, and Syngenta, but we need to do more. Um, and we're going to have to keep a close eye on this budget. Thank you. There we go. My phone, my, my phone was ringing and I muted myself and then I couldn't get back on, sorry. Um, the next one is District 4, Amber Quitno. Same question, major challenges facing the county board. I would have to agree with Lori on this one. COVID-19 is definitely a um, major challenge right now to the board because um, of all of the implications of COVID-19. So many people out of work um, and the budget has uh, definitely taken a hit. So thankfully there is a cushion and um, we will definitely have to um, keep on top of the budget to make sure we would maintain a true and balanced budget and help the constituents as much as possible with loss of jobs and um, uh, the emotional and psychological issues that they're dealing with uh, because of COVID. Um, mostly I would say budgetary issues right now because of loss of revenue. And um, we'll have to go into the budget and see uh, where we could make cuts if necessary, depending on, on how this evolves from now and if we get a vaccine relatively soon to really get a handle on this. Thank you. District 8, William Bell Cummins. Yes, thank you. Um, same question, I assume. Yes, sir. Well, as, as others have mentioned, the, the pressure on the budget is going to be significant. It has, has been already. Um, now, fortunately and, and unfortunately, in a sense, we rely on property tax a lot for our revenue. Uh, now, property tax, in the fortunate part is for, property tax tends to be fairly stable um, and doesn't go down when the economy goes down immediately. Uh, on the other hand, it's hard to raise property tax, and we certainly don't want to do that because we have high property taxes already, and yet uh, there might be uh, some people who would look to property taxes as a way to help fill the gap uh, in the budget. I don't support that, and I think that's a, not a good idea be because of the highness of our property taxes already. So we do need to look at other ways uh, to raise revenue. And fortunately, the new businesses that other people have mentioned will help uh, with that. I think I'm probably out of time. Uh, Christopher Porterfield, District 8, same question, major challenges currently facing the DeKalb County Board. Thank you. Uh, I, I think we all pretty much agree on this. Uh, in a existential or a, or a spirit sense, um, COVID, uh, and Black Lives Matter are terribly important. Um, partially as a result of COVID um, and other forces, uh, we do have the budget concerns. And I certainly agree uh, there that that's, that, that's a, uh, an item of, uh, of prime concern. Um, it occurs to me also that uh, uh, we have changes. It's an election. People on the board are gonna change. Mm -hmm. um, uh, a real challenge to us right now is what kind of board are we going to be? Uh, we have been a very good nonpartisan, everybody works together kind of a board. Uh, we got some big personnel changes going on that we already know about within the, within the board. Uh, so we need, to, we need to think about that. What kind of board are we going to be? Thanks. And to finish up this question, District 3, Patrick Deutsch. Major challenges facing the DeKalb County Board. Without a doubt, uh, COVID, and the budget uh that's that's you, you you just can't you can't overlook that um it's going to be tough balancing things when when you don't have the income uh, and some some other incomes have changed or will be changing uh, hopefully things will balance out with the with the ferrara and the and uh, facebook and and syngenta coming in um, Otherwise, there's, you know, that, that's that's the main thing that we're going to have to be watching for, as well as you know, 
as Chris mentioned, uh, reaching across the board and, and people cooperating with one another. Thank you. District 4, Lori Emmer. Um, name one potential source of new income for the county. Uh, I mentioned in a prior, uh, we need to look at attracting marketing more revenue in that more business coming in. We were really fortunate with Ferrara and Facebook, but we really need what other companies can we get in? Um, can we use them to say, hey, we have them, what else can we have come in? They're great jobs. Also, marketing us to say, get more small business coming in. So, um, they're great. Uh, we need more jobs. We need more people to work so they can spend more money in stores and bring revenue in. Thank you. Thank you. Amber Quintno, same question. Did it work? Okay. So this is actually part of my platform and I plan to actively recruit and source uh, more diverse business models to bring into the area through um, marketing, but I have been seeking out local resources that uh, may be able to do it that are going to school that would be willing to help out at a lower cost to the city, uh, maybe some interns. And I also happen to be a recruiting expert, so I am very good at, at that. And um, so I do have a plan put together to actively source and recruit to entice these businesses to come in and ramp up the revenue so that we don't have to be so dependent on tax on property taxes. Thank you. District 8, uh, William Bill Cummings, one potential source of new income for the county. Well, I think, I think the popular one tonight, obviously, is, is getting people to work and uh, more jobs and more, more taxes coming from those folks. Uh, no question, that's, that's probably the best way. Uh, as I said before, we cannot raise property taxes. They're already at the, at the highest we can possibly have them. Uh, so we do need to get, get more businesses. Now, we haven't really felt the effect yet of, of Ferrara and Facebook, uh, those facilities are still being built and uh, you know, will be completed uh, in the next couple of years. And so we will start to see some of that revenue coming online, um, which is certainly gonna, gonna help. But we have to remember that there's gonna be a lot of demands over the next year or two, particularly uh, on that new revenue. Uh, the county will be involved, I'm sure, with the administration of the uh, COVID vaccine once that becomes available probably next year. And our county health department needs to be well funded uh, so they can uh, carry out their mission. Thank you. District 8, Christopher Porterfield, your um, answer to this same question. Um, the answer, the answer has to be economic development. Uh, I like Amber's point about small business too. Um, we, we are, are thrilled about Facebook. We're thr thrilled about Ferrara. That's a, that's, that's a big impact, but we need to be sure we're welcoming small businesses too. Um, uh, and I think that, I think that does have an impact. Um, the, uh, uh, I, I, I don't see um, much, much else in, the, in what we can do uh, to get more money besides those two features. I, I do think we need to think about what our budget is, how much, how much we have, and what we want to spend it on. I think Bill is quite correct that we need to spend some more money on uh, uh, public health and COVID, but where's that money going to come from? Mm -hmm. uh, that's our problem. Uh, and we need, we need more public involvement in talking about the budget uh, and making those priority statements. Thank you. Thank you. District 3, Patrick Deutsch. Sources of income. Yes. Uh, obviously, the the new businesses, uh, whatever we can do to, to bring new uh, small business, uh, as well as uh, any, any new uh, large businesses that would be coming in as well. Um, 
just need a total line on, on taxes. Uh, I'd hate to, hate to raise uh, property taxes at all. Uh, that's, we're, we're already paying enough. I, I think everyone can agree on that. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Joshua District 3, new sources of income for the county. Uh, yes, I'll uh, agree with a lot of what everybody else is saying around uh, continuing to use our enterprise zone to attract new businesses. I want would like to see them be diverse business. Um, you know, Facebook's great. The, you know, the candy company as well as the, uh, the ag com companies. In the more agricultural areas of our county, I, I would like to see even more ag, uh, ag tech and ag related businesses come in. But to Amber and Chris's point, small business is also extremely important in this. And I would like to make sure that our area remains attractive for people to come open a shingle, start their own restaurant or small business and really revitalize our downtown areas in the process. Thank you. Thank you. Um, District 4, Amber Quint, uh, Quitno, name something specific that you are willing to cut. <laughs> oh, that one's a loaded question. <laughs> oh, um, I honestly, <laughs> I've looked over the budget and they have been so good at keeping the budget fair and balanced. There's like barely any wiggle room. We would have to cut non-essential non-essential programs so that would be so difficult i don't know that i can answer this one off the top of my head I, there are such good programs that we're funding um you know i i i would have to give that more than one minute thought to, i mean that's that's a question that really has to take a lot of things into consideration before um going there and i would i would try everything possible before cutting. Thank you. Yep. District 8, William Bill Cummings. Same well, nasty question. <laughs> that, is, that is a tough one because I, I agree with Amber. I think if you look through the budget, there, isn't, there doesn't appear to be a lot of, lot of waste or unnecessary uh, spending. Uh, that's been cut uh, over the you know, recent years. Uh, one way that organizations do sometimes uh, deal with this, and I know NIU, where I spent a lot of my career, is not filling unfilled positions. And you hate to do that because you assume that, that those people have been performing essential functions, but it may just be necessary not to fill positions right away and to essentially save that money uh, for uh, other uses, at least in the near term. Um, and it's, again, a, a difficult thing to do uh, because usually you, you, you need the people, but um, if, if it becomes necessary, I think not filling the unfilled positions may be the way to go. Um, District 8, Christopher Porterfield. There, there are different strategies for this kind of thing. Um, if you cut some little program uh, and get a little bit of money, people may not notice it but somebody is still getting hurt. Um, uh, I, I like Bill's idea of, um, of cutting back on personnel a little bit. I think that's a good idea, a little bit. Uh, I think you should cut where people are gonna see it and people are not gonna like it because there's no room to cut. So you want an answer? I'd say you cut highway and you cut the sheriff's department. And I just made a bunch of enemies, but if you're gonna make cuts, make them visible. District three, Patrick Deutsch, where are you gonna cut? That's a tough one. Uh, as a dairy, dairy and grain farmer, uh, we, we cut back and, and do, do our own repairs as much as possible. Uh, I don't know what the replacement costs are specific in, in the highway and in the sheriff's department. Um, those personnel definitely need to be able to get their jobs done as well. Uh, I guess I would, I would agree with Bill and, and not fill 
positions that where people are retiring uh, immediately. That, Thank you. Oh, go ahead. That, that would be my best bet. Okay. District three, Josh Orr. Taking a look at the budget, um, yeah, there's not a lot of fat in there. One of the places where I would focus attention just out of expertise is on IT expenditures. Um, that is a big-ish item on the budget. Um, and I think, you know, oftentimes IT and information handling can be done while cutting costs just as well, just because of the economies of scale that are currently going on. Um, so that's something that I would take a look at and take that kind of approach and expand it out to the other county departments, you know, saying we're just going to slam cut this department or, you know, across the board or anything else is just not, not a good approach in my opinion. It's to really take a look at the core functions of each office, make sure that they're appropriately staffed, and then see what other functions the office is performing and, you know, what's the cost benefit on that and, you know, make selective strategic cuts. Thank you. District 4, Lori Emmer, you get to finish out this fun question. Thank you. This is really tough. Uh, we currently have a hiring freeze. Uh, and I listened into the Finance Committee last night. It's, it, this is tough because COVID has really taken a hit on our incoming revenues. We really don't have wiggle room in this budget right now. Uh, I'm on the highway committee too, by the way, <laughs> uh, and um, we need to keep these roads safe and uh, wouldn't cut there. Uh, there's really nowhere to cut. I've been on this board when we made a lot of huge cuts in the past. Uh, I've looked over this budget. I just don't see it right now, especially when we don't know what's ahead of us still. So I would want to err on caution with this budget at this point and wait and see. It, we could be looking at nasty cuts ahead, but right now I would not want to make cuts at this point. Thank you. Thanks. Um, District 8, William Bill Cummins, name something specific that the county could do better and how to do it. Well, you know, I've, I've, I've thought about this one a bit is it, I think the county does a lot of things quite well. I mean, I've lived in this county for 36 years and, you know, I've always been amazed at, at how well there. Sure, there are there are some gravel roads I'd like to see uh, 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 paved, but I'm not sure this is the time to get into that. Um, actually, letting the, the people know in the county what it is we really do. I think there's probably a lot of ignorance in a sense. Um, and, and not not out of any um, not of any nastiness, but just people don't know. I think we need to do a better job of probably teaching the people in our county what it is we do, because there's some very important functions, and it's not just the the sheriff's deputies on the roads, but uh, as as has been mentioned a number of times, the health department does an awful lot, and particularly now we're calling upon the health department to do lots with this COVID. Uh, crisis, and I think we just need to do a better job of getting that word out to the people of our county. Thank you. District A, Christopher Porterfield. Um, uh, I, I agree with what Bill had to say there. Uh, I think we need we can do a better job on informing people of the budget. Uh, we have we have meetings; they're open to the public. I need to. Re I think we need to reach out more uh, with people and talk about. Um, um, the past budget, and uh, we need to work on, on setting priorities. Um, and I think that, that if people knew more, as Bill suggested, educator, as Bill suggested, um, if you tell people, if you explain to people uh, how a situation works, um, they're, they're, they're going to be reasonable. But they're not going to be reasonable if they don't understand what's happening. So we need to do a better job uh, through open meetings um, and special meetings, workshop meetings, uh, to explain what our funding situation is and what our budget is. Thank you. District 3, Patrick Deutsch. <clears throat> what can the county do better and how? Uh, the county is, you know, everybody does such a good, such a wonderful job on everything. Uh, it, it, 
I guess I don't have a whole lot of complaints. The, 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 the previous boards have been doing, doing uh, a, a wonderful job and uh, I want to say, you know, keep improving the roads. We've got a lot of roads that, that have really been improved a lot lately. Um, but there's still a few gravel roads out there, but, you know, budgetary constraints are, are, are going to dictate that. Thank you. District 3, Josh Orr, same question. So I'll echo a couple points. Uh, citizen outreach and getting people involved in understanding the process, I think will lead to just better outcomes in general and people being more reasonable, as Chris mentioned. Um, there are a lot of aspirational changes that I would like to make, um, you know, infrastructure projects and whatnot. COVID's going to complicate a lot of those, like what I would suggest for those initiatives. But once, you know, we can get the budget stabilized We've really got to work on things like rural broadband um, because right now there are students at a great disadvantage because they don't have access to the online education that the same level of access as other people, as well as traditional infrastructure such as roads and bridges. Thank you. Thank you. District 4, Lori Emmer. Thank you. Uh, I certainly agree on doing a better job informing uh, everybody in the budget. But I also uh, want to talk about the Cal County Business Incubator Program. We have done a great job in the past informing the public, but I really think we knew, need to do a bigger push on that. It's been around since 2016. Right now, there's only one um, client in there. And this incubator, I think, is really great for helping people uh, for getting small business started in our county. And right now I think it's underutilized. And when we're talking about getting small businesses, promote a small business promotion in our county, we really need to do a proper job promoting that. And this is something our county does. Uh, and we need to, we can do, and this, during this time of COVID, I think this is the right time to do a bigger push. Thank you. Thank you. Amber Quitno, same question. You have me, did it work? Okay, they had me blocked from unmuting myself. Um, I think hands down what the county can do, county board can do better um, is actively seeking out the constituents feedback, actively communicating with them, doing the research first and presenting it to the community in a way that's easy for them to access, really putting out polls and questionnaires and, and just, um, being that leader to really bring the information to them because they're working, they're taking care of families and being on the board, we need to actually, you know, make a concerted effort to get that information to them so that they aren't finding out decisions we're making on the board after the fact. I want to actively engage with all of them and uh, make the community a much bigger part of the decisions that are made. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, the fifth question will start out with uh, Christopher Porterfield from District 8. Mm -hmm. Climate change is underway. What can the county do to be proactive rather than reactive to it? Um, that's a wonderful question. Um, difficult, but wonderful. Um, th there has been a, a, a recent initiative um, by the county board um, working with a... Um, um, a um, uh, solar group uh, to, to set up um, a facility uh, on the grounds of the um, outreach building and uh, um, the uh, uh, nursing rehabilitation center um, area off of Annie Glidden. Um, and, and that's a good move. And we, we talked on the county board about trying to increase the size of that, uh, trying to do more with solar ourselves. Uh, to help out and, and to be also a model, an example. Um, and I think, I think that's an important thing. Um, uh, hmm. <laughs> I'm, afraid that, I'm afraid that's all that comes to mind, uh, but at least I'm glad we're doing that and we're working towards um, uh, more support of, of solar. 
Thank you. District 3, Patrick Deutsch. Uh, what can the county do to be proactive about climate change rather than reactive? I guess to, to expand upon uh, Chris's comments, uh, I like the idea of solar. Um, on a dairy farm, we've been approached by uh, different entities of, of using solar uh, to reduce our reliance on, on ComEd and the power, power companies. Um, I would be more in, in favor of solar uh, simply because the footprint later on, you could, you could take out a solar farm and put it back into agriculture where wind, wind farms, mm -hmm. that structure is there and, and it's, it's never gonna go away. Um, just to be, be a leader in the community and, and go with, with solar, I think is, is a positive step. Thank you. District three, Josh Orr, same question. Yeah, I'll echo, echo the, you know, Patrick and Chris on that, that uh, expanding solar um, energy in our area is a great thing to do to contribute over the long term. And I really like the fact that it's local production of energy. It's, mu it's money that comes into our community, um, yeah, from the production. Now, I've another thing that I would want to explore more is this is going to impact, you know, impact agriculture. We saw the extremely wet uh, early season last year cause a negative impact. I wanted to I want to reach out and listen to the agricultural community and see if there's any way that the county can support them in kind of mitigating some of those negative effects. Thank, Thank you. you. District 4, Lori Emmer, same question. Thank you. I have been in favor of solar farms, solar gardens. Um, I was proud to uh, vote yes for the recent solar garden at our county outreach building. So, um, and I'm in favor of continuing to explore that. Thank you. Thank you. District 4, uh, Amber Quitno. Same question. So I am in favor of solar. I, I would work with the farmers to support them in their endeavors uh, for um, solar and sustainable energy help um, you know, work around the ordinance issues and help um, the ag industry in general to adapt to the changes that come along with, um, with climate change and you know, what comes down from, from the, the state and federal level. We have to help our ag community um, really make those changes, whether it be from grant that we help them um, apply for grants from the state, do everything we can to really support them um, and also the farmers like um, Gerke grass fed, I'm very much in support of that. So we can get more farmers on board with um, the more natural farming methods. I think that is very, very helpful and uh, just support them as much as possible. Thank you. Uh, District eight, William Bill Cummings, the same question. Well. It, it appears that solar is very popular with us, and I, I would certainly agree with that. Um, you know, we're, we probably all would agree that we're very fortunate. We're not in areas with hurricanes or fires or, you know, terrible effects of, of climate change. But it's obvious we do have some here, too. Uh, somebody mentioned about the, the heavy rains in the springtime. Yeah, there may be some connection to climate change uh, with those. And, you know, we do have to take this seriously. Uh, what would be wrong with our county making a commitment, uh, a reasonable commitment uh, to be achieved over probably a period of 20 or 30 years to become carbon neutral? Um, I know many companies who have done this. I know uh, other governmental units. I don't know about counties. There may be counties in other parts of the country that have done this. But I think we should seriously look at that. Commitment to becoming carbon neutral by maybe it's 2050, uh, probably beyond most of our lives. But anyway, I think it'd be a good thing to look at. Thank you. So let's start with closing statements and we're gonna go in reverse order. So we're going to start with District 8, Christopher Porterfield. One minute closing statement. 
<laughs> um, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you to the league for doing this. Uh, I really wanted to see the uh, film because my mother was involved with the league a long, long time ago. Um, anyway, um, uh, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to talk. Um, again, I'm running in the 8th District. I ask for your vote. Um, the, uh, um, uh, I've really enjoyed my time on County Board. I want to keep on doing it. Um, uh, I'm really pleased at the, uh, at the group we have here today. I think the county is going to be in good, in good hands uh, regardless. Um, and uh, um, uh, I thank you and, 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 and please vote. That's it. Thank you. Uh, William Bill Cummings, also from District 8, your closing statement. That's also, well, well thank you, uh, Jan, and to the league for putting on this. And I would want to agree with Chris. I'm, I'm really glad to see all of you. And I think there's a lot of good ideas uh, that certainly have come out uh, tonight. And so I appreciate the opportunity to do this. Um, I guess, you know, why, why do I think I, I would be a good person for this, this position? And I do want to thank Chris. I think, you know, our district has been well represented uh, over these last few years, but um, I think my experience, my life experience, and my professional experience do prepare me uh, pretty well. I understand finance and accounting issues pretty well from my professional experience. And I think, too, in my life experience, I try to be a good listener. I try to be somebody who listens to both sides of issues. You know, there's a lot of controversy in many of the issues that, that we face. And so I always try to be a good listener. And and listen to both sides of issues and make a make a reasoned judgment. So uh, thank you. Uh, I'm William on the ballot. Please don't forget that, but I go by Bill and I ask for your vote. Thank you. District 4, Amber Quintino. Thank you. Oh, so sorry, Jan. Thank you, Jan. Thank you, League, for giving us this platform. Um, I'm asking for your vote because I am deeply invested in this community. I am a strong voice. I will not back down. Um, I will not stay sitting down when I need to stand up. I will not back down. I will ask tough questions. I will demand answers. And I will bring a level of accountability that I think the people are um, really asking for. And um, I come with uh, nonpartisanship, wanting to work with um, everybody on the board to find solutions. And I, I promise the constituents that I will absolutely stay very actively um, engaged with you and take your thoughts and your desires into consideration for everything that I am tasked with uh, considering for the board. I ask you to vote for me, Amber Quitno. Thank you very much. Thank you, District 4, Lori Emmer, your closing statement. Thank you, uh, League of Women's Motor, and um, thank you for this opportunity. Great ideas today. Um, I ask for your vote, uh, District 4 Sycamore. Uh, it's been great being on the county board where we all work together, bipartisan. Um, I uh, bring experience. Um, I um, bring leadership. And I... Uh, I want to continue serving the community I live in. I listen to the constituents um, and, wow, <laughs> but uh, thank you once again. And please, once again, vote for me. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, District three, Josh Orr, your closing statement. Well, once again, thank you to the league for hosting this. And again, last week's event as well. Um, my name is Joshua Orr. I guess now I should mention it appears as Joshua on the ballot. So Joshua Orr, uh, County Board District 3. I'm, as I said at the outset, I'm running to bring, a re bring reason, honesty, and experience to the board. I'm looking forward, I'm eager to get back to uh, public service. And I look forward to uh, representing our district. Thank you. Thank you. Patrick Deutsch, District 3, your closing statement. I want to thank the League of Women Voters for having this forum. Uh, just want to, uh, you know, I, I'm a third generation 
dairy and grain farmer north of Sycamore, and, and I'm, I, I've lived my entire life in this area. I'd like to, you know, as, as a dairy farmer, I'm a, I'm a small businessman, and, and you know, we, we have to look through everything and, and find ways to, to make things work. Uh, I'd like to bring that experience to the board and, and work across, across the aisle with, with everyone. Uh, I like to think of myself as being approachable by my, uh, what would be my constituents, all of my neighbor, friends and neighbors. And uh, again, I guess, uh, get out and vote. And I'd appreciate your vote on, on November 3rd. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So that ends this section. Um, we have four candidates that represent um, four districts. Sorry. Um, that their opponents did not notify us that they would be participating tonight. So these four candidates will just give a two minute statement. Um, and so we'll just go uh, right down District 1, 2, 5, and 12. So um, timer, this is the one that's different. This is two minutes. Um, not a, everybody else is a minute, but this is two minute, uh, one two minute statement per person. So okay, District... Dan, just to let everyone know, I only have the, uh, the card, so I'm gonna start notifying at the 45 second mark. So you have the first minute and 15 before I do anything for you. Okay, so um, the first statement we will hear from Kathy Lemkins, District 1, two minutes. There we go. Good evening. Uh, my name is Kathleen Lampkins, but most people call me Kathy. I would like to thank the League of Women Voters and the DeKalb Public Library for this opportunity to introduce myself. I am the Republican candidate running for a seat on the county board in District 1. I have lived in DeKalb County for 45 years. I have been married to my husband, Don, for 45 years. We have three daughters. Becky Springer, Erica Snodgrass, and Jessica Gale. I am running for county board because I feel I have a lot to bring to the table. I started my working career at DeKalb Ag Research for 10 years, followed by 13 years at Duplex Products, and in a short few months, I will be retiring after 22 years of working for the DeKalb County Circuit Clerk's Office where I am the Chief Information Officer. One item of concern that I know is facing uh, the DeKalb County Board is the county's decrease in revenues due to the pandemic. The County Board is gonna have to work to find ways to still provide services currently provided, but with less funds without digging too deeply into our reserves. I can offer DeKalb County my time and service as a way of giving back to the community that has given me and my family so much. Again, I want to thank the League of Women Voters and the DeKalb Public Library for hosting this event. Thank you. Our next speaker is District 2, a statement from Christy. Slavinus, I'm sorry, I'm not ex exactly sure how to pronounce your name. I'm sure you can do a better job. <laughs> thank you, Jan. Uh, thank you to the League of Women Voters and thank you to the DeKalb Public Library. Uh, my name is Christy Slavinus. I'm running for um, the county board seat in District 2. All of my neighbors in Genoa and Kingston. Um, I am a good fit to uh, fill this seat. I have lived in Genoa for over 30 years. I've raised my family here uh, and I've stepped up. I've been very involved in the community, both within the district and around the county. 
I believe in giving back and this is an opportunity to do that. Um, I presently am on the uh, Kishwaukee Valley Heritage Society board and I'm the secretary there. I've noticed the strength in our partnership with the DeKalb uh, County History Center and another uh, uh, countywide um, uh, opportunity I've had is many work, I've taken many workshops and classes through the DeKalb County Nonprofit Partnership and uh, I've also worked and volunteered at Safe Passage. I think I have a unique perspective on how to see, well, I've seen how all these entities and organizations are so important to our county and they keep us stronger. And so the communication between them and, and uh, respecting all of them is important. Um, my skills are suited. I have a degree in uh, education from the University of Missouri and in counselor education from NIU. I bring to the table a desire, a love of learning. Uh, I love to listen to both sides of an issue and really help collaborate and, and make good decisions to um, have uh, DeKalb County even better. Uh, I will, I, <clears throat> and thank you very much. Thank you. Our next statement is from uh, Sasha Cohen from District 5. Good evening. My name is Sasha Cohen and I'm running for DeKalb County Board District 5. I want to start out by thanking the League of Women Voters and the DeKalb Public Library for hosting this forum tonight. One of the most important responsibilities of any representative is to be transparent with the people they represent. That's why I was so happy to be here tonight. I am running because the people of DeKalb deserve representation that will fight for them, for the issues that matter to them for an end to the prosecution of addicts and a move to a public health-based model of drug treatment, for an end to the continual rising of property taxes that hurt retirees and others on fixed incomes, for an end to preferential treatment to outside corporations and a real investment into Calb's own residents. I wanted to talk about transparency though. A centerpiece of my campaign is being open with the voters. I invite everyone to check out my website at sashafordecalb.com or my Facebook page, Sasha for DeKalb. I am disappointed that my opponent has not chosen to appear, to hear from you all, to respond to your concerns, and discuss what she stands for. I am more disappointed that she has not chosen to have a website or any other place you can find where she stands on the issues. That is not how I intend to serve. I pledge tonight that if elected, I will continue to maintain my site and my social media, and I will use them to announce every single vote that is taken on the county board along with how i voted and why the people of this district deserve that i will be a representative for all i want to once again thank the league of women voters for hosting this event tonight and if you'd like to hear more about where i stand on the issues since i wasn't able to participate feel free to reach out through social media or email and i pledge to personally respond i hope i can earn your vote this november thank you thank you and our last two minute statement is from uh, Brian Kubisek from District 12. Yes, ma'am, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, League of Women Voters and uh, the DeKalb Public Library. And just to everybody for being here, I appreciate it. Um, so my name is Brian Kubisek. I'm a lifelong resident of Sandwich, Illinois, uh, to the Southern DeKalb County uh, District. Um, I wrestled for its wrestling team, played chess on its chess club, and even helped culminate support to build uh, its two skate parks. <laughs> so I'm no stranger to public sentiment and, and basically organization for, you know, the betterment of our community. Um, my father and I have donated a lot of time and effort to the community, and I plan to continue to do that. Uh, I currently work uh, and a union shop for electrical, and um, we're planning to actually expand even further uh, into solar. Um, basically, my primary goal is to bring back uh, just accountability and transparency in our government. Um, I want to achieve that basically um, by, how do I say, opening up FOIA requests, opening up more opportunities for <clears throat> people to get involved in our, our county board. Um, maybe we 
continue to expand the uh, the virtual participation as well as do when we get into uh, get older COVID, we can do a more uh, personal in in tune meeting, but also extend it virtually. Um, I would really like to take a lot of uh, time to <clears throat> get into the drug addiction issue. Uh, my community has lost close to 20 different people in the last year, and um, at the end of the day. That is one of the things that is hitting this community, aside from COVID, in a really bad way. And I think COVID is taking an even bigger toll on it just because of the sheer fact that people don't have everything that they were doing. They're not keeping their minds busy in the same form of fashion. Um, that is one of the biggest things that I want to tackle. That's probably the most primary thing is reinvestigating our task force for our drug addiction and our drug counseling and the drug court program. Uh, and just see more justice and uh, criminal justice accountability. Thank you very much, and please vote for me. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, candidates who are running for District 6, 7, and 9 are um, not opposed, so they were not invited to participate tonight. So our last group, thank you all for staying with us, is District 10 and District 11. District 10 um, candidates are Mary Kozad, Kazad, Jeff Whalen, District 11 is Karen Cribben, Roberta McFarlane, and Court Shut. So let's start out with the opening statement for Mary Kazad. Kazad, okay. Kazad. Um, as you know, my name is Mary Kazad, and I'm running for DeKalb County Board in District 10, located <laughs> for the most part on the south side of DeKalb plus much of Cortland's first precinct. I am a recently retired NIU Spanish professor. I've lived in DeKalb for 35 years and have a long history of public service, including eight years on the DeKalb District 428 School Board and volunteer work for the National Breast Cancer Coalition and the American Cancer Society. I have volunteered for many state, local, and federal candidates. I am a fluent speaker of Spanish. Most of all, I am very hardworking. I care about my district, which has been a wonderful place to live and for my husband and myself to raise our family. County board service is a lot like school board service in that much of what it does is nonpartisan. And although many of its tasks may seem routine, they are in fact very important. Thank you. District 10, Jeff Whalen, your opening statement. Hi, my name is Jeff Whalen. I have been on the county board now going on 10 years. I moved to DeKalb back in 1963, so I've been a, a resident of DeKalb County for 57 years now. I can't believe it, but it's been that long. Uh, I met my wife out here in DeKalb. Uh, we married uh, going on 57 years too for the wedding uh, and our anniversary. We have two children. Uh, I'm sorry to say my daughter passed away last year, mostly due to the virus that is affecting everybody right now. So the COVID virus. So um, uh, we have two grandchildren, both of them in the, one's in the high school right now and the other's at Kishwaukee College. So I hope to continue on the board because it's, it's my opportunity to serve the community. That's what I want to do. Thank you. Thank you. Um, District 11, the first candidate to do an opening statement is Karen Cribben. Hi, I'd like to thank the league for providing this forum. Um, my name is Karen Cribben and I'm a Republican candidate for District 11. Uh, District 11 covers Clinton, Victor, Squaw Grove, Afton, Pierce, and parts of Cortland and Samanac townships. I'm recently retired as a chief deputy to DeKalb County Office of Assessments, where I worked for 12 years, which has given me some insight uh, into the county board. I was appointed to the county board in August of 2019. My husband and I farm in rural Squaw Grove Township, where we raise crops and have a small cow calf and feeder operation. We have a sandwich phone number, Salmonock address, we vote in Hinkley. Our children went to Indian Creek School District in Waterman, Shabanaw. I attend church in Emanuel in DeKalb, and I worked in Sycamore. So I'd like to think that I have some interest in several parts of the county. Thank you. Thank you. 
Um, our next uh, opening statement is from District 11, Roberta McFarland. Thank you. I'd like to thank uh, the League of Women Voters and the DeKalb Public Library. Um, I am Roberta McFarland and I'm running as a Democratic candidate for District 11 to represent my uh, neighbors. Um, I uh, married my husband in 1973 and we have two children, um, Aaron and Carol. Um, we all went to school, Aaron, Carol and I, at the same time and that was where I learned how to balance a whole lot of needs and work hard and have a lot of self-discipline. Um, I have a bachelor's in biology and education and two masters, one in um, counseling, one in educational leadership. Um, my counseling uh, experience, I was 19 years as a counselor, taught me to really listen and um, seek the heart of the problem. And my uh, science background and my counseling background um, helped me use data to find solutions to problems and to track our progress towards solving them. Um, so I um, appreciate this opportunity and again thank you and uh, please consider voting for me November 3rd or before. Thank you. Um, District 11 court shut is uh, up for the opening statement. One minute please. Yeah, thank you. I uh, appreciate the, uh, the opportunity to speak here for the League of Women Voters and the Cal Library. Uh, my name is Court Shute. I live in Waterman. I've lived here for about 15 years now with my wife and son. He goes to Indian Creek uh, School District. Um, I'm an IT professional and I, I work from home, but my, my job is primarily as a problem solver. That's, that's what I do for a living. And it's something that I believe that I can bring to the county board. Um, I would, I'm running as a Democrat and I would like to bring those democratic values to the county board. So, you know, the, the, the values that I hold, I believe are the values that, that my neighbors hold. And I would like to have those represented at the county board level. Uh, in that regard, I will fight for openness and transparency within the government and, and for a fair and just government for everyone in the county. Thank you. Thank you. So you all have the advantage of have, having heard all those questions. Earlier. <laughs> so you're, you're not going to get hit with that, you know, that, that one nasty one, you, you've, you've had time to prepare. So let's start with the first question. Uh, District 10, Jeff Whalen, what do you see as the major challenges currently facing the county board and how would you work to resolve them? For one thing, the major challenges facing the county board right now is the health of the county. The COVID virus has really affected everyone in the county. It's had an effect on our economy. It's had an effect on uh, people. We have lost 41 residents to the virus so far this year. And I hate to see that, but our nursing homes, both the DeKalb County Nursing Home and the Pine Acres and the one down in Sandwich, have also had some people who are become very ill, mostly because of the virus. And we've tried to approach that. And how can we solve that problem? First of all, we can have people be sure to wear their mask, be sure to distance themselves from each other, and be sure not to go in large crowds. Uh, I'm afraid that our four restaurants in town have been put in mitigation again by the state of Illinois, and they can't have that many people in the restaurants. Thank, Thank you. you. Karen Cribben, District 11, same question. Um, I have two, um, COVID in the budget, um, the governor has taken control over what's being done regarding COVID and his restrictions have had an effect on our budget. The proposal for 2020 is that 1.2 million be taken from our reserves to balance the budget um, and due to the COVID effect on the lack of sales tax income and uh, the cost of personal protective equipment um, as expenses are in there also. Um, a balanced budget has been set up for 2021, and we'll just hope that we can keep that. Um, the other thing is Gary Hansen, the county administrator, is retiring as of 1231 of, night, of 2020. I feel he's done an excellent job in heading up the county and will be difficult to replace. Um, an ad hoc committee will be appointed from the county board, and they will be in charge of searching for a new administrator and submitting his or her name to the board for approval. It will need to be voted on and approved by the board, and hopefully this can be achieved by the December 31st date. Thank you. 
Roberta McFarland, uh, what do you see as the major challenges currently facing the DeKalb County Board? Um, I would agree that um, the impacts of COVID, both on our health and on the budget and um, on people's mental health <clears throat> has been very um, uh, earth shattering. Um, I think that the part of what we need to do as we move forward is to be responsible and um, maintain our distance and wear masks and be uh, very cautious and leave if we're in a situation where it's not comfortable. I have a friend that um, did not do that and came down with COVID. Um, I'm also interested in, in hearing more about contact tracing that had been done in a lot of other countries that made it possible for them to manage things better. They had uh, done and, and, and not completely shut down or not take the graduated steps. Um, so I think that that would be something that I would like to explore further with the County Health Department and the County Board. Thank you. Court Shoot, same question. He's muted. Great, thanks, sorry about that. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I, I ask you some of the, the ideas that are plaguing the, the county. It, COVID is a absolute uh, you know, public health crisis. And I think that one of the ways to combat that is by enforcing and you know, reinvigorating our health and human services within the county to make sure that, that they have the proper funding, to make sure that they have the proper equipment, and, and to make sure that, that they have all the resources that they need. And, and frankly, I, I appreciative of Governor Pritzker's work that he has done to help the, the state compared to other states. I think that that's a, a very good thing that, that he has done for us and would, would like to work with him and make sure that you know, mask enforcement is, is carried out and make sure that um, you know, we're doing all, like, all that we can to, to fight this disease. And the contact tracing idea that Roberta had is, is a very good idea. We should be exploring options for that which, you know, potentially jobs for, for citizens here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mary Kazad, District 10. Okay, obviously, as everyone else has said, the main challenge facing all government entities at the moment is the coronavirus pandemic. It affects tax revenues because of the decline or closure of small businesses and the inability of laid off workers to pay property taxes. It also requires additional expenditures for personal protective equipment and COVID-19 testing for county employees, especially those uh, with the county health department, uh, the county nursing home, uh, the sheriff's department. Uh, fortunately, the county board has accumulated reserve funds equal to 40% of the budget. Uh, which it should now draw down on, and I'm sure it is, uh, as much as possible to weather this crisis. When the epidemic is controlled um, or ended, it should be able to replenish those funds. Otherwise, keep passing balanced budgets, maintain the hiring freeze, make cuts where needed, mostly through attrition, hope the state's graduated income tax passes. That's, you know, that, Pray, everyone, and tell all your friends and relatives to vote for it. Thank uh, you. Keep Thank encouraging you. votes. Your time is up. Uh, Thank you. Growth, et cetera. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, District 11, Karen Cribben. Name one potential source of new income for the county. Well, um, for our on Facebook, coming to DeKalb County is good for our tax base. And hopefully that will bring in funds uh, for DeKalb County Schools because the schools are the majority, taking the majority of our uh, property taxes. Um, and it would be nice if we would have more growth. And hopefully this will also um, have people moving to live in DeKalb County, which may contribute to construction and, and uh, additional sales tax. Thank you. Thank you. District 11, Roberta McFarland, same question. Um, well, yes, it would be um, jobs are a good way to increase um, incomes because then you have more economic activity going on. Um, I'd like to return back to the contact tracing a little bit also because um, other countries have been able to use that to help control the virus and control the spread of the virus without shutting the economy down. Um, and so I think that that, um, you know, having a, a dual approach there of, of 
um, recruiting businesses, large and small. Um, in the prior um, presentation from some of the candidates, they talked about the um, um, incubator for small businesses. And I think that that sounds like a, a wonderful way to encourage new businesses to come. We need to uh, talk about our educated workforce as well as the transportation. Uh, we're a great transportation hub to recruit businesses here. District 11, Court Shoot. Uh, um, you're shut. I'm sorry. One. Shoot. Two, shoot. Oh, I got it right the first time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Name one potential source of new income for the county. <laughs> uh, and I think that this is going to kind of tie into to, to the climate change question that, that is coming up, and and that is incentivizing uh, green jobs, right? These are great jobs um, that, that we can incentivize for the, the creation of new jobs by incentivizing green projects. Um, I would like these to be union jobs. I think that's a, a very important fact that we need to keep in mind is that union jobs pay well, union jobs are good, and, and they will bring in more revenue over time as the, the union workers stay here, live here, work here. Um, so focusing on things like that is is where to um, to, to go. Yeah. I, I like the idea of working with NIU, making sure that they are you know part of the community and they were working closely with them on, on any projects that they might have to, to keep that revenue coming in. Thank you. Thank you. District 10, Mary Kazad. Okay, well, I would completely agree with encouraging new businesses to come in and the county board and the county in general has done a very good job of doing that with three major companies uh, that are in the process of coming in. But I would also um, like to encourage everyone to support the graduated income tax because I think uh, long term our best uh, new income will come from a complete restructuring of the tax system and less of the money having to come from local areas. Um, I mean, there's only so much you can do with property tax. You, uh, you reach a point where you've taxed people beyond a reasonable limit. And I think um, getting more state funds would be what the, the ultimate solution. And I, you know, I also like green jobs. I also like, uh, you know, maybe if some kind of out, some kind of infrastructure type jobs, but coming from outside, uh, bringing in new workers, et cetera. Thank you. Jeff Whalen, District 10, same question. Well, what I would like to see is that use of old properties. Now we're getting three new industries coming into the Dick County and they're, um, the majority of the two of them that are coming in are going to be in District 10, really uh, by Gurler Road the candy company coming in and that will uh, supposedly by the time they get fully qualified, fully grown up, there's going to be a thousand employees there. The employees for the Facebook are only going to be about a hundred, but they're very high paying jobs, better jobs. The places I'd like to see, I was, when I first moved to DeKalb was district nine, which has the old general electric building. The General Electric building has been sitting vacant for, I don't know, maybe five, seven years right now, and there's nothing going in there. I'd like to see the use of those old buildings like that, rather than use up the new farmland we have. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next question will start with District 11, Roberta McFarland. Um, which is the great question that everyone enjoyed last time. Name something specific that you are willing to cut. <laughs> um, and I, I, you know, the extra time didn't really help me come up with anything to cut. Um, I um, do think that it's going to be very difficult. Um, the board has been very responsible so that there's not a lot of fat to cut. Um, I think that um, I, hopefully we are not the only county or even the only state that is really struggling with the impact that COVID has had on our uh, budget. And so I think that um, some of the solutions will be beyond what will happen um, in our county. Um, the fair tax would certainly help, um, but I even think that we're gonna have to do something nationally. Um, um, if not, <laughs> that it's just too big of a problem for us to solve in, in, in those terms. Um, I think if I were in that position of having to cut short term, I think that attrition might be 
Um, unfortunately, one of the few things um, I'm hesitant to do, um, do something bigger. Thanks. Thank you. Court shoot. Do you have something you'd like to cut? Uh, no, I don't. I, I think that not only is it a, 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 a kind of a nasty question, but I, I think it, it assumes that something needs to be cut. And I don't think that that's a necessarily a fair question to ask because it's already presupposing the answer that something does have to be cut. Um, I, I agree with Mary and Roberta in the, the idea that, uh, you know, this is bigger than the county and that the, a, a fair tax is going to help all of us. And, and so we should be pushing for things like that to to reduce the, the local property taxes going into that. So no, I would I would not cut. Thank you. Mary Kazad. Okay. Is there anything you're willing to cut? Uh, I, I too think it's a, a terrible idea to cut if there's any way to avoid it. But also I agree with Bill Cummings and as all, someone who was a university professor at the same time he was basically, uh, I think it's gonna have to be through attrition, uh, not rehiring people, not hiring people for jobs when someone retires or leaves to go elsewhere. The only other thing I could suggest is turn this problem over to the finance committee, make sure all of them have the copies of the budget in front of them and tell them, go and find every penny that we could possibly cut while doing the minimum amount of harm to the county. And that's, it's, it's difficult. These are difficult times. The university has already faced this. I was not replaced when I retired a, a year ago. I don't know if Bill was or not. He may have been, but yeah, it's, it's incredibly different, uh, dis, um, di difficult, and it's gonna hurt the county no matter what. Thank you. Jeff Whalen, have you got something yes. you're willing to cut? Uh, well, last night I sat in on a finance committee meeting and the, there is really no place to cut really because, you know, knocking on doors and going around campaigning right now, people have said, well, can you cut my property tax? Well, the property tax for the county is only going to be approximately 20 $25. So that much money but when you add that to what the school district is going to and all the other taxing bodies are going to throw onto your tax bill, it all adds up. But where do you cut? It really, we don't have that much to cut at all. We are spending down from our form, but if we have to spend down too much out of there, then next year we'll be going to the budget and say we need more money. So we may increase property tax that way. So right now we just need to say, hold it as is. Attrition is probably the only way right now. Thank you. Thank you. And District 11, Mary Cribben, same question. Um, as I said before, um, we have uh, $1.2 million coming in out of our reserve. Uh, for 2020, it was a balanced budget until COVID. Uh, this 1.2 million will handle um, any of the, decrease in, in um, income um, from taxes and also uh, any increase in expenditures. Um, I guess next year, from what they've told us, that the 2021 is also balanced. That's not considering if we have to add anything additional in there due to this COVID thing. Um, well, we're not going to know that until we, until next year gets here and we have to actually spend the funds. I guess if absolutely necessary, I think we could have a cross the board cut where we would um, let the elected officials and the department heads um, tell them we, you need to cut your budget by a certain percentage and let them be the ones to determine where those cuts are going to come from. Thank you. Um, we've Thank done that before you. when I was working there. Your time is up. Okay. Um, court, shoot. shoot. Um, name something specific that the county could do better and how to do it. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a few things there. Um, I live out in Waterman. I drive up 23 all the time. And so it's just, it's just one thing that I see in my life several times a year is accidents on the, on the highways. I, I I don't know how much better they could be because I know that improvements have been made to the intersections um, in the, the rural parts of the county, but I always take care to, to look in those 
uh, intersections and would like to see if there's any any more rumble strips any more lights any more anything that could be done in those particular locations just it's, it's such a part of the life out here in the the county um the other one would be just to make sure that the uh if there's anything that we done with the sheriff's department to ensure that you know um, psychiatric and um, people could be used to assist the the sheriff's department um to de-escalate situations Thanks. Thank you. Mary Kazad, same question. Okay, um, the county board could work to improve relationships among the different races and ethnicities in DeKalb County and diversify DeKalb County leadership. It would be wonderful if the percent of countywide leaders reflected more closely the percent of Black and Latino residents of the county. The board seems to be making progress in that area, but could be more. For example, I listened to the DeKalb County board sponsored uh, forum on race on June 3rd. Not only were many of the testimonials quite moving, but it was an opportunity to listen to and really hear people um, um, of other ethnicities. Perhaps that's an experience that the board and other organizations could repeat once a year. In addition, the board needs to seek out members of minority groups for staff and appointed positions. It might also be a good idea to create a diversity commission, budget permitting one day, like the DeKalb City Human Relations Commi uh, Commission as such a body does not exist. It could uh, be an opportunity to receive public input on race relations, sheriff and government um, interactions with local residents, human rights, et cetera. You're, thank you. Jeff Whalen, same question. Oh, what could the county do better? Well, for one thing, when I first got on the county, we first started the drug court program, which has helped tremendously with the uh, residents of the, the county. And uh, you can see that works. Right now, they are working on trying to get a mental health court going too, which would help uh, the residents of the county. What I would like to see us do is go out and get more people involved, whether you can send them a letter and say, hey, there are meetings this day, this day, this day, if you want to be in, on the meeting, there's a committee meeting for Forest Reserve, there's a committee meeting for a highway, there's a committee meeting for this. All they have to do is show up and give their testimony if they want to at that meeting. It's not that difficult. If we could just some way inform the people of the county when these meetings are and get them to show up and give their advice to us. Thank you. Thank you. District 11, Karen Gribben. Uh, something um, that the county could do better. Okay, um, although I realize that Zoom meetings were set up due to COVID, I've taken advantage of uh, this procedure by listening to uh, several different committees other than the ones which I've been appointed. Um, I believe Zoom meetings should continue, although the minutes and recordings are put online that may take up to a week, and that's not a complaint because I know it all takes time. But um, if I go to Sycamore for a meeting, I have to allow myself 40 minutes. Um, Zoom meetings are perfect for me and I just want to remain informed on subjects that other committees are discussing and may come up before the entire board. Unless a board member is on the committee, they are not allowed to speak, only under public comments or if the question is addressed to them. I believe this gives all board members an opportunity to be informed in a timely manner. I also believe that more members of the public may become involved in local government if it was more accessible. And District 11, Roberta McFarland, the same question. Okay. Um, when I first got interested in the county board, I started to kind of poke around on their website and um, there is an incredible amount of information there, but it's mm -hmm. difficult to access. Um, it's just so overwhelming. Um, and one idea that I will uh, state that I got from Paul Stoddard's town meeting was like, even with the budget, instead of looking at a, a giant spreadsheet with all sorts of numbers, you could do some things with graphs and other things. So I think that there are a lot of ways that all of that information can be made uh, more accessible to people who don't want to slog through all of the minutes or whatever. Maybe some uh, frequently asked questions, maybe bolding the more important parts of different meetings would help make that information more uh, available to voters and might even inc increase participation as Jeff had talked about. Thank you. Mary Kazad, climate change is underway. What can the county do to be proactive rather than reactive to it? Well, obviously, as other people from other districts have said, 
um, emphasis on solar energy, solar gardens, solar farms. I really, really liked Bill's idea about trying to have uh, the county commit to becoming carbon neutral uh, within the next 50 years. And I can, I really, I really can't add more than that. Uh, plus, you know, obviously uh, encouraging uh, uh, savings of energy by uh, making sure all county buildings and you know buildings in general in the county are well insulated on encouraging lowering of the, uh, the temperatures in people's homes, uh, just all of the traditional things to uh, lower the amount of energy use, especially um, carbon fuel type energy use. Um, some, of, uh, some of these ideas, you know, come from the federal government or state governments, but, you. Um, you know, just co conservation you. and solar power. Thank you. District 10, Jeff Whalen. What was the question again? I'm sorry. Sure. Um, climate change is underway. Mm -hmm. What can okay. the county do to be proactive rather than reactive to it? They are becoming right now proactive because one of the meetings I attended talked about trying to address the situation and make the what we call the campus of the county which includes the buildings downtown Sycamore and the buildings out by the uh, outreach building and the nursing home and trying to make them solar powered in some way. Looking at that right now, um, the outreach building will have a solar panels built right next door to it. And that is going to cut our electric bill for that just that one building by a significant amount, by almost $100,000 or more a year in that building. So that's a outstanding way we're doing that. The other is they're looking into um, converting some of the other power to the other buildings that we have. The, as Mary pointed out, they need to really insulate some of these buildings to make them more uh, efficient. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, District 11, Karen Cribben. Do you have ideas for the county to be proactive uh, on climate change? Well, in my district, we have wind towers. Um, they're a little more difficult to put up now with the restrictions that have been put in place by the county board. Um, but the solar farms and gardens, um, those are quickly going up or have reached a point where um, uh, there, there's a majority of them that are asking for approval. Um, they do take more farm ground, and it's, it's usually farm ground, than the wind towers. Um, the other thing is um, farmers um, have made some, uh, also s some adjustments in their farming due to weather conditions, uh, such as uh, no-till, which helps with the erosion process. And I guess that's all I have. Thank you. District 11, Roberta McFarland. Um, yes, um, the, we are making progress with solar and wind um, power and other uh, renewable energy resources. Um, I think that that's kind of the low hanging fruit. In all honesty, um, we are going to, I think, need to look at our farming practices that are uh, using a lot of fossil fuels. And I've also um, have read information um, that there's carbon sequestration, which sort of stores carbon in the soil that has been done on a smaller scale. And perhaps that might be something that would be um, able to be brought to a larger scale. But we need to start looking at ways to decrease the amount of fuel that we need to produce the same amount of, of uh, food and products and not hurt the farmer's income. Um, but we have to look, start looking at agriculture as well. Thank you. Um, Court Shoot. Yeah, um, so I would fully support a commitment to be carbon neutral by some future date to be determined. Um, another aspect of this would be to, you know, not just using the um, the farmland for solar, but using rooftops for solar, right? There's, there's nothing to stop us from putting solar panels on lots and lots of rooftops and incentivize that, right? So 
make there make there be an incentive for businesses, offices, um, county itself could be putting up solar panels on more and more of the rooftops. The city could be doing that. Um, push for types of things like that to not just use the, the the farmland, but to use all of it and through an incentive process. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we're going to do the um, closing statements in reverse. So we're going to start with Court Shoot. Uh, one minute closing statement. Yep, thank you. Um, I appreciate the, the opportunity to talk here. Um, and I think that, you know, we've kind of touched on this in a lot of the, the responses that we've been given, but the, the push for a fair tax in the county is, is important and it will help us all, right? It, it will help with any of the, the budget issues that we may be having. Um, yeah, been on several times. Oh, so, uh, um, statements. Mary. <laughs> oh, okay, so it's over. Almost now. Mary. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, thanks. Um, I I appreciate your support. Um, I, I would like to bring these democratic values to the the county board and for my neighbors and friends in the Waterman, Hinkley, and you know other areas of District Eleven. Thank you. Uh, District Eleven, Roberta McFarland, your closing statement. Okay. Um, again, I would like to thank the League of Women Voters and the DeKalb Library, as well as everyone who's participated today. It's been very informative. Um, I would um, ask people to consider voting for me if um, you agree with um, having a more fair way to structure taxes and uh, give help to schools and municipalities um, so they're not so dependent on property taxes. Um, looking at all sorts of alternative ways to um, address the uh, climate change problem, as well as looking at racial justice, which is very important. Um, so um, again, thank you for this opportunity and um, please consider voting for me. Thank you. District 11, Karen Cribben, your closing statement. Um, we have lived and farmed in Squaw Grove Township for 33 years. The Cow County contains 406,000 acres, of which approximately 90% is agricultural. I not only re represent the villages in my district, but I also represent the farming community. I've only been on the board for a year and it's been a learning experience. I um, am only on two committees. Um, since COVID and Zoom, I've been sitting in on many of the committee meetings to familiarize myself with other county responsibilities. Attending these meetings also helps in having some background information when subjects come up before the county board. I have attended township meetings um, to introduce myself and let them know that I'm the representative on the board. As a conservative woman who has worked for the county and is married to a farmer, I feel I have a lot to contribute. Um, my name is Karen Cribben. I'm running for a position on the county board for District 11. Thank you. District 10, Jeff Whalen, your closing statement. Thank you very much. Thank you to the League of Women Voters. I thank the Public Library for housing this. Uh, my closing statement is, I forgot to tell you guys, I was born in Chicago, uh, one of 12 children. I'm number 11 and 12, so I had to do a lot of battle with brothers and sisters. I have five brothers and six sisters. So I did uh, did my way and got along mainly with the county board. I have served on the finance committee. I have served on the economic development committee. I'm currently on a forest reserve committee and the law and justice committee. I want to continue my work for the people of the county and hopefully that you will continue to vote for me for the next election. Thank you very much. And District 10, Mary Kazad, your closing statement. <laughs> okay. Um, I would like to thank the League of Women Voters for hosting this forum and for their work in setting it up virtually. Thanks as well to Samantha Hathaway and the DeKalb Public Library for running the technology. And to my Republican opponent, Jeff Whalen, for attending. In these difficult times, it is important for citizens to step up and be involved in government. County board service is a particularly useful kind of involvement. It is especially important in this period of the coronavirus and revenue shortages for the members of the county board to spend the maximum amount of time in problem solving. 
In that way, the county will better survive this crisis and move forward as the uh, prosperous agricultural, urban, and educational community we have always been. As a recent retiree, I have an abundance of time to devote to the board and would be honored to receive your vote between now and November 3rd. Feel free to contact me at marykazad at gmail.com with any suggestions or problems. Thank you. Um, so apparently, Kiera Jones, who is a candidate for District 5, is on the phone and the League of Women Voters of DeKalb would like to give her a two-minute statement. Oh, nice. So, um, Kiara Jones, you have two Hi, minutes. Hi, yes, Kiara. Okay. Um, first, I'd like to just give thanks to um, the um, League of Women Voters and DeKalb Public Library. Um, on behalf of my opponent, Sasha, I believe um, I will apologize for him for firstly, for not properly checking the Zoom screen, which would have showed that I have been in attendance for this meeting. We had some te um, technical difficulties on both ends where I was not able to unmute myself. And for secondly, um, falsifying information about me. However, I do have a social platform. I might be found on Facebook, Kiara Jones for DeKalb County Board District 5. And my number is publicly shown on DeKalb County government official website. Moving forward, um, moving forward, I will continue to um, play a big role in my community. Um, I am proud to represent my district, my community, and my neighbors. Every day since primary elections, I have been active in my community, and every day I will continue to strive to meet every resident need. Opportunities can and will be created. Resources will be given to all those in need, such as childcare, employment, community engagement, and um, infrastructure development, and many more. Thank you all once again, and I, Kiara Jones, will make sure that we will strive in District 5. I will see you all November 3rd at the poll. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, our event, that ends our event for tonight. For more information, please visit the nonpartisan website, IllinoisVoterGuide.org, powered by the League of Women Voters of Illinois. We appreciate your participation, whether you are a candidate or a voter. It is essential to preserve our freedom in our country. Please remember to vote, whether it is by vote by mail, early voting, or on election day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night, Good night and out of here. Thanks, Emily. All right. Thank you, Jan. Thanks, Samantha. Yeah, thank you all. It was really interesting Thanks, hearing everyone's uh, points. Yep.